All right, so let's get started. This is the first part of a two part um, series on decentralized finance. And we're gonna be covering Ethereum mostly. Ethereum is essentially the first blockchain that allows you to write smart contract and uh, the first widely adopted blockchain that is used to build a lot of digital solutions, including finance. So we'll talk about why, uh, you know, or how the blockchain works and why can it be applied for financial use cases? And then the, the um, mechanics of how information inside the blockchain can actually be used to achieve financial outcomes. Today, we're gonna stop at decentralized lending. And next week, we're gonna come back and talk about stable coins, another hot topic today uh, in, in today's discussion and also decentralized exchange. And if we have time, we'll talk a little bit about the yield farming and the returns mechanisms inside this world as well. So to get started, you know, um, think of this as a, as a warm up question. Um, I'm gonna post a link in the chat box. So once you click on that link, it will take you to a Mentimeter a Mentimeter session, Mentimeter poll. I'm gonna ask you a couple of questions in this session so that you know we can get a bit of interaction going. If you can access this Mentimeter, uh, please uh, you know, press the reaction button so I know you're in. And once we have sufficient people in here, we'll get, set, we'll get started with the first question today. You saw on the slide, right? Um, you know, the first question of today is what is Bitcoin? So I'm going to ask you a question on Bitcoin. I'm assuming that you guys are familiar with, with Bitcoin already at this point, but let's talk a little bit more in detail about our understanding of uh, what Bitcoin is. Okay, let's see how many of us we have here today in class 33. So wait for about 25 or so and we'll get started. All right, great job. Looks like you guys are, are mostly in. So let's go to the first question today. We'll ask you a couple of questions only, but if you have any other question along the way, then please feel free to ask in the chat box. So um, you know what Bitcoin is. So how would you categorize Bitcoin? What is Bitcoin? I have options for you. So please feel free to choose the options which you find um, appropriate for your understanding of what Bitcoin is. I understand it's not the best way to do a poll because usually when you do a poll, you're not really supposed to review this result midway, but it's kind of informal poll. So not, not a big, not a big uh, concern in this context. Okay. Um, quite, uh, I would say a majority, I guess, of our responses are, are is centered around the commodity definition of Bitcoin. Um, we do have some other variations as well. So um, for those of you who, who, who said other, um, if you don't mind, would, would you like to share your, your view of if it's not currency, if it's not commodity, if it's not collectible, then what does others mean in this case? For, for for your for your response when you say others, what do you have in mind? If it's convenient for you, you can always turn on the microphone, or you can uh, type in a chat box if you like. And in the meantime, others. Okay. If you answer currency, okay, or anyone who. Uh, who considered answering currency, what would make Bitcoin a currency? What properties would you like from something that you would use as a currency? Actually, let me ask this broadly, right? You can, you can uh, 
chime in all, all you want. If you answered commodity, if you answered currency, if you answered collectible, what made you answer, what made you give those answers? What is a commodity? I answer commodity because I think Bitcoin is more like gold than, than currency. It can store value, but it's not really a medium of exchange because by by the technology, by its concept, it is not used to pay for for um result provider in the blockchain uh, in the Bitcoin environment and also it's not not Except as a um, payment for tax. It means a payment. Cap. Okay. Thank you, Kaplo. So let me ask you a follow up question. Um, what is a commodity? If we take Bitcoin out of the question um, and define commodity as an asset class, what properties do commodities have? Others, you can help, uh, you can chime in as well. What other, what other things in life you know that are commodities other than gold? Crops and crude oil, Cap. Yeah, Cap, oil, crude oil? Crops and crude oil. Okay, Cap, crops, very good. Produce, right? Crops produce uh, oil. Gold, precious metal. I, the definition of commodity is actually something you can consume. Uh, if you look at what commodities are that are used as money and so on, uh, tobacco, gold, for example, actually have uses, right? You can actually smoke tobacco, gold, you can make into, you can make into uh, jewelry, accessories, or components in electronics, a produce you can eat. But can we dress with Bitcoin? Can we eat Bitcoin? Maybe Bitcoin source value but by definition of commodity it, you can't actually consume Bitcoin as you could consume other commodities. If it's currency, Lo said, you know, you can't use it really as a means of payment. There are many properties of money that, that, that makes money money. I'm writing a book called Future of Money and next week the, the first draft should be ready. So I'll, I'll give you a copy of that early draft so you can have a look at the discussion of what money is as well. Collectible. I can collect Okay, maybe that's, that's a little bit more, a little bit closer to what you do, right? If you think this increases in value and you want to collect it, uh, trading cards, um, artwork, antiques, and so on, are kind of collectibles as well, and they increase in value over time. Or maybe it's a, I don't know, a, a, a call option, right? On the future where everyone adopts uh, the usage of this digital information. So if you ask this question to people, right, you get different answers, very different answers, and rightly so, because in essence, Bitcoin is, is information, right, stored inside a shared a distributed ledger, right, shared database that anyone can access, right, anyone can make changes to that database, provided that you follow some rules. And once the changes are made inside that database, that's a consensus mechanism that makes everyone agree on the changes to the information inside that database and then ensure that this is the, the right copy of information. If there are other versions, alternate truths out there, that's a way for you to reject those alternate truths. Um, all right, very good. So thank you. This blog I like a lot. Okay, um, it's, it's been written almost a couple, uh, almost two years and, and a bit now. And it was written to introduce what what blockchain technology is and how you achieve consensus inside blockchain. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, you know, use up your time uh, today, but you can, you can read for this. You can read this for yourself. It takes about seven, eight minutes or so. And um, the author actually makes a very clear and simple exposition of what is being done inside a blockchain to make sure that the information inside, the data security and so on is secure and what miners are inside. Uh, the roles of miners are inside the blockchain. Um, to cut things uh, into the essence that I want to um, 
you know, um, start you off with today, this chair database is open, right? People can volunteer to, to store that database and also process changes that database. But in the world where volunteering doesn't really bring any benefit, right? you need to actually have a, a reward mechanism for people to want to volunteer. And the mining part, the creation of information inside, the creation of Bitcoin in this context is done so that if people value these Bitcoins, and that means Bitcoins have prices that um, if people want this information to be transferred to them, you can charge people for, for the privilege of being able to transfer that information you possess to, to um, whoever wants to buy that information from you. So as long as those Bitcoin units have a monetary value that people want to trade them with, this blockchain is going to give you rewards. But when I say you, I mean the, the nodes, right? The computers connected to internet that volunteer in um, keeping the order of this network. And from time to time, if you win via the, the mechanism, right? If you're the winner, you will be credited with the information inside a blockchain. And that would be your reward okay, for doing this hard work that uh, without this mechanism, nobody is going to maintain this decentralized database out of just altruism. Okay, and we just call this mining essentially uh, to reflect the, the similarity between a miner trying to dig out gold uh, from earth using hard work. So here you dig out Bitcoin by providing computational power through what's referred to as a proof of work consensus mechanism to make sure that this database is, is agreed upon its consensus is built and also secure. Now, this is the central in technology okay, behind any blockchain databases. But the information contained inside blockchain databases depends on what you are willing to allow. So for example, if you look at, uh, I think btc.com is a website. This is what's called a block explorer. Okay, you can explore inside the content of the blockchain, what each block contains. So we can have a look at a sample block inside. Let's see, I think these are the other related statistics. So let's just explore this block. Okay, let me zoom in so you can see this a little better. A block height is essentially the ID of the block. As you can see, it increases, okay, one by one, because this is block number. Block number 717662 okay, precedes block number 717663. And the algorithmic, um, sorry, the, the, the hash functions and also the cryptography make sure that these blocks are, can be chained together in a way that uh, people accept. So in this block, uh, we have people who, you know, uh, mine the block essentially. Um, at the time the, the, the block is mined, inside the block, how many transactions or communications between, between people inside this database occurred and how much reward has been given okay, to, the, to the, either the person or the, the group of computing power that uh, won the race to mine, main, to, to, to record this block. And they were given 6.2865 uh, Bitcoin. And this is how big the size of the block is. And you can imagine, right? Um, this is less than one megabyte. Your, your cell phone picture is a lot bigger than this. So the blockchain doesn't actually store that much information. And, um, and uh, they did it because if you want people to maintain a database in a decentralized manner, right? You, you don't really want information to be overloaded because otherwise not everyone can actually participate in this volunteering activity to maintain this database. So each block, um, was you know, the size of the block is a, a design factor in a blockchain on, on um, what kind of uh, participants you would allow okay, by having this design. And the fee corresponds to the fee that you as the user of this blockchain would have to pay to the, you know, to the blockchain network for, you to, uh, for them to record your transaction for you. So you can imagine a blockchain as like a big, uh, a big, stone tablet, I think this is an analogy used by a lot of people who, who try to explain blockchain, right? Imagine there's a big tablet inside 
the, the village, everyone can see what's on that, uh, on that tablet, who owns what and who, who, who transfer what to whom. Everything is visible. And anyone can actually record information on that blockchain, but not by themselves. You would have to pay the volunteers inside uh, this village. Okay? This village actually has volunteers who, who would then you know, be the one who record information on that stone tablet. So you would pay those fees to those, um, you know, to, those, um, to those volunteers for them to engrave your rec records on the tablet for you. And the amount of fee you have to pay depends on how difficult it is to engrave information on that, on that tablet for you. Okay, so that's what transaction fee um, uh, is there for. It is there, for you, it is there to prevent people um, asking the, the engravers to engrave a lot of useless information on there because otherwise it makes the blockchain space, which is the rare, the rare, um, what's the right word to use? If you are running a blockchain, you're in the business of selling block space to people, right? This is a rare commodity. I think that might be the word that you could use in this context. The rare commodity inside a blockchain is a space so for people to record transaction on a blockchain, you have to find a way so to pe for people to not record useless information. Or if they really want to record that information, they have to be willing to pay, right? Otherwise you end up um, having spams inside the network instead. So information recorded inside a blockchain has been thought out a lot already because you know, the cost associated with recording information on there. And that's essentially um, the, the, the summary okay, of what this blockchain uh, thing is about. So if you look at in, if you look inside one block, each block would have an ID number. Okay, this long string of text and and numbers represents a unique ID of this block. And once you look inside the block, okay, you can also see the individual transactions that occur inside this block. There's a series of fifteen hundred and five transactions inside this block. Each transaction also has one uh, the unique ID as well. And inside you would have um, um, additional information about who is transferring what to whom. So each address the transfers from and to other people would also be a string of text and numbers as well. This is the unit of identification inside the blockchain. So here you can see that uh, this okay, address transfers, I think, is this the right, right direction? Maybe. This address transfers to this address and this is the amount being transferred. That's all some bit of a fees being deducted. So you, you transfer X, uh, you receive X minus epsilon at the other end. Okay, and not a lot of information in here, but this is enough for you to make a meaningful economic transaction. If you want these numbers and you're willing to pay okay, to, to buy these numbers, or if there are other people willing to, to buy these numbers, this, transform this uh, digital transfer of information can um, allow you to achieve a money transfer if you like. And these numbers essentially represent like uh, the baggage carrier, right? You exchange money for, for um, these units, which are then transferred to the destination. And then your recipients uh, exchange that information for money again. That was the intention behind Bitcoin. Right, but then people realize that oh, the you know the digital carrier baggage information units here that's meant to just carry value across, actually increases in price over time. So you know you end up hoarding it instead. So this channel, okay, this numbers that's meant to be used just as a tool to settle, um, you know, account balances across different people across uh, across different places on Earth, became something that people wanted to hold instead. All right, so a similar thing happened with gold too. People used gold in the past to settle transactions, but then people realized, wait a minute, I don't need to settle transactions with gold because if I hold gold, uh, the settlement value of gold increases over time. People are willing to pay, uh, pay more wheat, pay more meat, pay more uh, goods and services in exchange for the same amount of gold that I have. So in this respect, this is why Bitcoin shares similarity to gold because it is meant to be just... Um, a transfer mechanism right to exchange purchasing power on one end to purchasing power on the other end but you need something to to connect the two in between and this um uh the carrier unit i think the word i use was that the carrier unit actually exists in limited quantity so the price 
of um, exchanging this carrier unit to purchasing power can change over time. So these, these units became something you wanted to, to hoard instead of just a tool to, you, to be used to transfer money across space and time. Okay, so that's, that's the um, short introduction to what this uh, blockchain is about. Now, in, Ethereum works in a very similar fashion, but Ethereum also allows you to write a different type of information inside these addresses. By the way, these are called addresses. Okay, sometimes people call these wallets, but they're essentially addresses or the ledger entries that belongs to you. Okay, um, you know, you have the ability to create these addresses yourself. If you have um, access to a private key, you may hear the word seed phrases. Seed phrases are uh, a facilitator to help you memorize your private keys. Right, but once you have the private keys, it becomes your proof of identity that if I own this private key, I can create um, any wallet, any address, okay, any number of address that I want. And once I have this address, and and um, if I own Bitcoin inside this address, by having um, access to this private key, I can submit transactions to this blockchain network, so I can transfer information I have in my address to other addresses. Right? That's the, that's the uh, working of blockchain in a nutshell. Now, if you skip toward Ethereum blockchain, um, a Ethereum smart contract essentially is information you engrave onto that stone tablet. But that stone tablet contains areas okay, which belongs to you as the address owner. You can just keep numbers inside your address, just like Bitcoin. Okay. You can also write text inside your address as well, but text by itself isn't meaningful. But you can write quotes inside, and then you can allow the blockchain to work in a way that if these are quotes written inside, the blockchain itself has software that processes these lines of code and calculates the instructions for you. Right? I want say if I want I want the blockchain to record information like one plus one equal two without hard coding one plus one equal to inside, I want to say declare output one as X, declare, uh, declare, declare, sorry, declare the first variable as X, declare the second variable as Y, let X equal one, let Y equal one, and then please compute X plus Y. Okay, these are sets of mathematical instructions that you can ask a computer like an, like an Excel to do. Ethereum blockchain essentially is an Excel spreadsheet that allows you to write formulas inside and then the blockchain will compute the, the transactions for you because on what what i have to mention is that all the computations all the recordings are done by the stone engravers so if your ethereum blockchain or you want to write a smart a, a blockchain that allows smart contract compute uh, capability what you're doing essentially you are allowing your stone engravers to not just engrave what you say on there, but for them to interpret your information as instructions. Then they can do the computations for you. They can do the math for you. And then they record the output of that math onto the blockchain for you. Okay, so that's how the Ethereum smart contract works inside Ethereum blockchain. So just like Bitcoin, uh, a wallet in an Ethereum blockchain is an address. You have private key, you have full control over it. Um, information that's accepted inside an Ethereum address is not just numbers, but you can write down pieces of quotes which the Ethereum virtual machine can compute for you. So if you're a node, um, if you maintain an Ethereum node, in addition to just recording information on the blockchain, you are also doing computations for users of the blockchain network too. They will submit instructions, they can't compute themselves, but you would compute them on your behalf. So that's why sometimes Ethereum is being, re being referred to as the computer of the world, because it's like a cloud computing, so to speak. Right? You don't do the computation yourself, you send the instructions, Ethereum network does the computation for you. So this address can hold, right, com uh, can hold uh, just numbers as information, it can hold um, sets of instructions, and one particular set of instruction is an instruction that says, hey, let's create a set of numbers inside my address. Right? So if I own an address and I write a quote 
and ask the Ethereum virtual network, a virtual machine to, to, comp to compute and record that hey, the, in the address that Ajahn Pai owns, he's going to have 20 million number, units, 20 million units of something inside his address, which he can then transfer to other addresses too. If I do that, right, those numbers become tokens that I create myself, which I can transfer to anyone that I want, but whether they want it or not, on whether they want to buy it or not, it's a different issue, right? What we have is essentially numbers which are transferable. I'm gonna come back and talk about that later. And that's, what, that's, and that's what tokenization essentially means in the blockchain world, right? You create uh, numbers inside your address that you can transfer to other people, but then you combine those numbers with other rights, like the ability to receive cash flow, the ability to, to vote on certain issues, for example. So those numbers then become meaningful. Right, and and once you you can write all these contracts, um, other you can give access to other people to use the functions written inside your address as well. So I can have other people like you know um, here we have uh, Alex. Okay, um, he calls a smart contract, and the smart contract resides in the address that I own and I write. But Alex wants to use my functions, so Alex can do so because you know I give permission for other people to use these functions um, containing my address. All Alex has to do is to pay gas to interact with smart contract. That is if what Alex wants to do will result in a change in the blockchain state. If what Alex wants to do as a function, he just wants to look up, okay? And he just wants to see what information is inside the blockchain, but he doesn't need to record information on the blockchain again. Mm -hmm. Alex doesn't need to pay any gas. So paying gas actually is associated with recording information on the blockchain. Okay, and how difficult is it for you to record that information on a blockchain? What computations are there? If it's really complicated, right? It uses a lot of lines of codes, the math is difficult and so on. It requires a lot more computation units. You're gonna have to pay more gas. So this transaction cost in, the, in this world is computed as the amount of gas, the quantity of gas, okay, and the price per unit of gas quoted in the, the native uh, numerical value. So here in this blockchain, you have to pay in ether which is the numerical value of the token of the of the digital information inside this network. And then the, the other layer is it also depends on what is the dollar price per unit of uh, either right now. So that's what determines your transaction cost. Now you can go and look at this block. Okay, they wrote this cartoon and explain the way Ethereum block, how smart contract and Ethereum blockchain works in, in, in a series of steps. Okay. So I hope what this shows you that the Ethereum network is essentially a state machine, right? It, the spreadsheet is a state machine because you see what's on a spreadsheet right now. You see all the transactions before. So if you want to see who owns what right now, all you have to do is sum up all the transactions that ever occurred between these two addresses. You would arrive at a state, right? Think of a, a balance sheet. At a starting point, the balance sheet has maybe zero, right? That's the first state. And then you have some transactions that come in and out of your of your accounts. So you have inflows, outflows, and so on. And you take stock at the end of say the first year. That balance sheet becomes, at the end of the first year, becomes your state, okay? And that's essentially how the Ethereum uh, blockchain works as well. You can look at snapshots at different points in time as a state. And if you wanna change the states, you submit these transactions. So once you do all the netting across um, the addresses on the blockchain again, you arrive at a new state. So just like in the flow type accounts versus the stock type accounts, the same thing works in blockchain as well. Okay, so let me pause now and see if you have any question on how the blockchain works and how the um, smart contract and so on works. This will be the foundation for understanding how decentralized finance works in a moment. Nothing yet? Okay. So let me continue. Okay, if you have any questions or, or um, that perhaps doesn't need immediate answering, you can always leave the questions inside the chat box. I'll come back and address them when the time arises. All right, so let's explore the Ethereum blockchain. Okay, we saw the, the uh, Bitcoin blockchain, so now let's look at Ethereum blockchain. Um, there are two, two levels of, uh, of peering inside a blockchain you can do. Again, this is a block explorer, which um, 
labels a lot of useful information inside the blockchain for you already. Because if you look at inside the blockchain and what it contains, it's just a string of text and numbers. Even the codes inside are not written in a way you can easily understand. So let me show you the first level of um, first level of um, visibility that you can see. Okay, so this first level is is the token level. Okay, um, information. So this is a, a stable coin, a token that pegs the price of the token to some some values that you find useful. For example, the the, the U.S. dollar. So the intention behind this token is to mirror the movements. Okay, and in actually no, to just have the, the trading price of one dollar, and it contains some you know, mechanisms to make sure that if the price deviates from the one dollar target, you can arbitrage it back to one dollar again. We're gonna come back and talk about that next time. We talk about stable coin and how it works, but let's just take it for now that this is how this works, right? So this is a smart contract that is created housed in this address the zero x is essential is it's like you know the the beginning right the beginning of uh of addresses the first two digits is almost always zero x and then the next 40 digits and characters would then give you okay, your unique identifying address so this is a contract a house at this address, it is written in a way that when you round to one unit, you allow up to six decimal places. Right? So numerical values inside the blockchain, you have to declare what's the primitive. When, when you put down one, what does one mean? One can be one cent, one satang. In that case, you have two decimal places. You can have six decimal places to allow for finer fractionalization. And in the, in the very extreme case, okay, the, the, the common unit that people use is 16 digits, okay, 16 digits. And one unit, I think, is called Wei, uh, name in honor of the, the Chinese computer scientist Wei Dai, who was, you know, contributed a lot of work to cryptography that was the foundation of this, of this um, uh, blockchain in, uh, architecture in the end. Okay, so all this information comes from querying the blockchain, max total supply, how much total supply is there at the moment, you can actually peer inside the blockchain and aggregate that information out. How many holders are there? How many transfers has there ever been between two addresses inside the blockchain? What is the most recent transfer? So here about 50 seconds ago, occurs at this transaction hash, the quantity is 45,000, but this 45,000 is already rounded, right? Because we have six decimal places. So you could actually specify your precision up to these six digits. So this second transaction uh, involves a transfer of 2,190.200125. This is about as fine as this can go. So once you click inside, okay, it would confirm information again. This is the receipt. The transaction hash, it occurs at this block number. This is the time it occurs from, this is the person who sends the instruction. So from means which address sends the instruction to compute. Sometimes okay, you can send instructions from A to transfer from an account in B to C, right? This can happen if you give permission, but most of the time it's, it's going to be um, A sends an instruction so that uh, the blockchain network sends tokens from A to B, right? It's the, you send instructions so that the address that you have ownership sends information to other address. But there are cases where you can write um, functions so that the person A has permission to send stuff inside uh, address B to another person in address C. Okay, that's possible as well. It interacts with this contract Right, and um, the block explorer would would label this for you. That, oh, by the way, this I know. If you look inside a blockchain, this is all you see. But but this address belongs to the stablecoin um, provider. So we're going to tag this for you for convenience. This tagging USD coin is not on the blockchain. And you only see this on the blockchain. This is done by Etherscan.io, the block explorer which tags blockchain information for you. So, you know, an outsider like us can understand what's going on. And then we can see that, oh, this is being transferred from this address to this address, 
And this is how, ma how many tokens are being transferred. Again, you times this by um, 10 to the power of six to see what units exactly occur on the blockchain. Now, to, to record this information, this transfer, right? The person who sends this instruction to the Ethereum network has to pay gas. So he, he's gonna have to pay this transaction fee. Once you break down this transaction fee, you're going to see uh, a lot more information like, oh, this is the gas limit, this is usage. A gas limit is your instruction to the blockchain network and say, I, I don't wanna pay more than 100,000 units. Okay, if, it, if somehow it consumes more than this amount of gas, I'm, I don't want transaction to go through. Okay. And 65625 is how much is actually used. Okay. So you specify you're willing to pay 100,000, but it's only 65,000 that's being used. So it's fine, transaction went through. And then that's a base, that's a fee, right? This is the units, I guess, in terms of units of how much you want uh, to spend. And then there's also the price okay, of the gas that you pay. This is um, per unit gas that you want, how much in terms of ether you have to pay. Then the final step is, if this is how much ether in the end that you have to pay, what is the price per, okay, what is the price per uh, ether that you, that you have to translate to in terms of US dollars right now? And this will give you the final transaction fee. So this, small transa this transaction of transferring 45,000 will cost you $21.86 in fees. The thing to note about how the way blockchain works is if you want to send $4.5 instead of $45,000, the fees would likely be very similar. Okay. There'll be some variations depending on you know, how much gas you want to spend to speed up and so on. But um, largely speaking, okay, largely speaking, um, it depends uh, on how difficult it is to process information, not the monetary value of this itself. So if you're transferring token that has no monetary value, you can, you can transfer billions of tokens, but the price per token is close to zero. And the monetary value of that transfer could be very close to zero, yet you have to pay gas anyway, depending on how difficult that transfer is. Now, there are other mechanisms inside the blockchain that allows for uh, this gas price to be reduced because people realize a, a high gas price can actually affect um, the way people decide. But that's the gist of how the transaction works, right? And let me remind you again, the, we have to pay gas because if that's zero gas, people will just send transactions on network endlessly. We're going to spam the network. In order to make sure that people think carefully before sending these instructions, gas price is necessary. And also, also on the flip side, you have to have gas to incentivize the nodes to do the computations for you. If you don't pay the nodes anything, there's no incentive for the nodes to really do all this um, you know, public service or providing the database and also computing the instructions on behalf of everyone on the network. Okay, so that's the, that's the um, token level information. You can see all transfers between addresses and so on, right? Some addresses are, are marked with names. Again, this is the, the outcome of community tagging. So people would submit the, the, the possible identity of these addresses to um, either scan. And then once they verify it, they're going to just leave it as that. So you know, OKEX is an exchange. So this is an, you know, a, a wallet address that an exchange holds. Coinbase is also an exchange. So we're gonna back, come back and talk about trading between um, exchange and also off exchange uh, next week. They would also tag right, the type of uh, uh, codes that are being called. If the code allows um, tokens in one address to be transferred to another address, then they will tag this as, oh, this is a transfer. If this code actually involves repaying a loan, okay, then, they, then they will tag, oh, this is a repayment of the loan. So here, Aave is a, a lending protocol. You can borrow from this protocol and then repay the loan later. So this transfer isn't associated with just a normal transfer or exchange. It is actually part of a decision to repay outstanding loan. Again, okay, this is kind of visible on the blockchain, but not very easy for you to understand. But with community tagging like this, uh, it is more, more understandable to the human eyes like us. Okay, next is the contract level. 
uh, information. So if you look closely, okay, these are the same addresses, exactly the same addresses, but the prefix of this website is a little different because the prefix here is address and prefix here is token. So this token page is designed to look at token transfers between addresses, but the address page okay, is designed to look inside this address, what information this holds. So you can look a bit more closely and see the contracts written inside this address. So this, um, I'm not sure whether you can see this, okay. This information is written okay, inside the blockchain as quotes, but, but that's a bit, there's a bit of additional information here. This is submitted for verification at either scan. Okay. So the owner of this smart contract submits this code to either scan for them to verify that this is the code I wrote on the blockchain. And the reason they have to do this is because what is visible on the blockchain is not this. What's visible on the blockchain is this. Let me see. Here. Okay. This is what you see on a blockchain, which, you know, okay, the computer can understand, but no human can understand this. This is what's available on the blockchain as a primitive information on that. So how do people know that, you know, what, what is the code being written on there? You would submit this code okay, for other people to see, hey, this is my code. Okay, so how do I check? Uh, let me compile this code, okay? Compile this code and then, and then let the computer convert this into ABI. And if the output looks exactly like what is recorded on the blockchain, then you're good. Okay? You really submitted the real code because the pros, once I decode this to blockchain language, it matches what's written on the blockchain. And that's what verification means. There's a question, uh, is this Python? This is Solidity, okay? Uh, the, the programming language chosen by, by, um, by Ethereum developers is Solidity. Okay? Other, other alternative languages that are being used right now is Rust, R-U-S-T, Rust. Okay, so in case you want to learn and these are the two common programming languages being used right now, all right? So all these nodes, right? If you're familiar with coding, you would know that these are instructions to the, to the uh, virtual machine that, hey, these are comments. These are not part of the code. When you compile, just compile these, okay? Just compile these, which are the, the real pieces of instructions. These are just notes. Don't bother reading them. They are written for human eyes, but for computer, ignore when you see this, Right when you see the slash and star, and once this you see another star and slash, this ends the ignore part. From this point onward, you can start reading the code again. And when you read all this, and it, if it matches with this, really, really difficult to read, you're good. And that's what verification via uh, uh, via either scan means, right? For, yeah, for other levels of, of uh, verifications, there may be audit companies like Certix, for example, that looks at the code, look at the code structure, relationship between different functions and see if it really does what it's supposed to do. Are there any vulnerabilities? Does the developer actually hide any backdoor for them to be able to um, you know, pull out all the information inside or not? And so on and so on, okay? So this is what I want you to, to, to see, right? It is very easy, very public for you to see what is on the blockchain, but seeing and understanding are two different things because the primitive information inside the blockchain is actually not meant for humans to read, okay? It requires a bit of, uh, a bit of knowing the structure and, and in some cases, it also requires disclosure by the owner of this address, okay? So if the owner of this address doesn't give you the source code in Solidity, you would have no way to be able to understand what this address actually does. Uh, I don't have those addresses saved on me, but during my research, I came across some addresses that are actually smart contracts. It contains code inside, but they don't submit this kind of human readable codes for the public to see. You can think of them as you know, a private um, algorithmic a trading that doesn't want other people to see the strategy, but I want to put myself on a blockchain anyway. Right? People can see all my trades, but they don't know the rules of my trades. 
this is actually a voluntary process. They disclose this themselves, right? And um, using the language to be familiar with, there are some, there are certain, there are certain uh, you know, standard, standard um, court lines of courts that people use. For example, um, you can you can have a very a very generic court that allows you to transfer tokens from one address to another. So I think I have the wrong address here. Let me see. Ah, okay. Right. That's a read contract and write contract. As I mentioned earlier, if you have a read contract, you're just reading information on there. For example, I'm reading um, you know, um, the balance of an address. So if I put down an address in here, it, I can query a blockchain. Does this address actually have any token in here? So I can, I can um, maybe query my own address, which actually has nothing in there. And hopefully this works. This is my Ethereum address. I'm going to put my address in here and say, hey, can you have a look inside this address and see if there's anything inside? I say, oh, it has nothing inside. Okay. You don't have to pay any gas. This is just a read contract. You can execute it. But if you want to write information on the blockchain, this is a write contract. Now you have to pay gas. Right. I'm, a, I'm transferring from this address to this address, so I have to declare. Right. Uh, so transfer is transferred from your own address. So you don't need to specify which address to transfer from. You only specify which address to transfer to. Another function transfer from is an address that allows you to transfer from someone, somebody else's address to another address. So you have to declare which address you're transferring from and which address you're transferring to. Okay, so this is to give you some context of how the smart contracts and so on are written inside the, the blockchain. Again, all this information that you record on the blockchain actually cost gas, right? When you create the contract, what you do essentially is you write information inside your address on the blockchain. So the first moment when you create this contract, you pay gas to the Ethereum blockchain for them to record all these codes that we just saw earlier inside this address. And now that the codes inside the address, it is up to the users, the people who want to call these functions to pay the gas to interact with the pieces of code I write inside my address. Okay, questions at this point? So anyone can create an address. All you have to do is to have a private key. I created this address with nothing, right? I can do, I create my address using um, a private key, which is stored online. This would be like, you know, um, online generation with the MetaMask, you can write down your seed numbers and seed phrase and so on, but you know, it appears on, on the internet. Another way for you to do this is to use uh, what people call a cold wallet, which is a hardware, a piece of hardware that contains your, contains the, um, your private key on there, right? So this gives you another layer of uh, verification and, and um, safety, right? But uh, to create private key, it costs you nothing it starts costing you gas when you want to record information on the blockchain and recording information includes doing transfers, right? Because that means I'll re uh, deduct number from my address, add a number from somebody else's address. That's a writing to be engraved onto the stone tablet. But as we saw earlier, if all you want to do is just to read, not that, not that uh, difficult. So let's see, um, let's look at, we're gonna come back to this in more detail in a moment. I wanna show you that when you read the contract that does have tokens, it should show the tokens inside. So I'm gonna look at a, a, a contract called CUSDC. This is a compound synthetic token by a compound protocol that receives the USDC token, okay? And converts it to other tokens as part of a lending process. So this compound USDC token is housed at this address. Let me copy this address and see if this address actually owns USDC. So based on this Etherscan information, this there should be about $787 million worth of USDC coin in this account. 
So I am going to see if this account one, when you query this using the USDC uh, read proxy contract actually contains this amount of tokens inside. Okay, so I pasted this um, compound USDC address. Let's query this. And now we see, right, it has $787 million worth of USDC inside. Again, we did all this without paying any gas. Okay, so that's a question in the chat. Um, what if we lose our private key my good bad news for you is once you lose your private key or somebody else has access to your private key, that's over. Okay, and that's the end of that address. If somebody has access to your private key, they can drain your account and nobody can reverse a transaction for you. If you lose your private key, that, that address is frozen forever in time. Nobody else can touch that. Okay. Unless you break the blockchain encryption mechanism, which uh, people say quantum computer can, but if that's the case, the whole blockchain actually doesn't work anymore. All the safety mechanism inside blockchain re uh, relies on the ability for any, any um, hard brute force um, trial and error attempt to, uh, to, to address, to, to, you know, to enter the, the blockchain address is so expensive that it may take lifetime to do so. That's what the encryption, the hash function, um, in uh, described in this in this uh, block does for you. Okay, so that's the primitive of what's inside. And when we say smart contracts, what do we actually mean? The lines of codes embedded inside wallets that can be computed using the Ethereum virtual machine, and two types of contracts. One is what anyone can use, just read it, right, and then we are done. And the other, the other one is a right contract is the one that would be called a transaction okay, on a blockchain because a transaction is essentially another engraving done on the blockchain. Okay. Ah, I wanted to talk about gas tracker too. So let me go back to that uh, and then talk about gas to you. Okay, we talked about how much, how much, how what gas depends on. Gas units, right? Depending on difficulty of computation and also how much you want to incentivize the, the, uh, the nodes so that they can expedite your transaction. And then there's a the price of gas, okay, which depends on you know, uh, demand over time. There's like a demand supply mechanism, auction mechanism that, that uh, allows gas price to change over time. You can uh, specify how much gas you want to pay as well. So you can actually specify both the quantity and the price of gas. But most of the time now, the, the um, the service providers will give you a recommended level of gas to pay. So they will give you estimated cost of certain transactions. A transfer we saw earlier, okay, like the USDC transfer we saw, is going to cost on average about $24, which is very similar to what we saw for that USDC transfer. If you want to use other smart contract uh, capabilities, uh, Uniswap Swap is uh, a decentralized exchange which, um, of tokens, which we're going to talk about next week. This involves a little bit more computation, so it's going to cost you higher gas amount for you to, to, to do this. You can also track where uh, which protocols, okay, which contracts are, are being utilized a lot and therefore consumes a lot of gas. So they'll call this gas guzzler. And the reason why they call gas is because they view these uh, payments as adding you know, petrol or gas, depending on your vocabulary list, whether you want to use British or American language, to, to fuel the computer uh, network that's behind the Ethereum network, right? To make computations, you gotta you know, add gas to your cars, essentially, that's the, that's the idea. So OpenSea is um, an exchange for you to buy and sell NFTs, and NFTs by themselves cost a lot of gas anyway, because it's very uh, informational, informationally intensive. So by nature, the, the exchange, any place that exchanges NFT will consume a lot of gas. And the second one is Uniswap. This allows you to you know, um, swap tokens without the need for digital asset exchanges like BitCup, Sipmex, Coinbase, uh, Binance, and so on, right? We're gonna talk more about that next week. And um, this can change over time. Right. Um, during places where, uh, during times where it's, it's really congested, you can maybe spend a hundred dollars 
per transfer, right? Because either the Ethereum price is really high or there's a lot of congestion on the network. Okay, people use congestion to, to, to uh, align with the, the car analogy, right? You, you add uh, gas to your cars um, to make your car run, but if the road has a lot of traffic, your car can't run very fast. So your transaction will take a little while for, for um, the blockchain to record that transaction on the stone tablet for you. Okay. So the reason why, why uh, we saw, right, the, the, the Bitcoin blockchain, each block contains about 100 um, kilobytes. And we also saw that people have to pay gas. Okay. Um, we also saw that uh, gas price can sometimes be very high to discourage spamming of the blockchain. This essentially comes down to how you want to design your blockchain, right? Because if you look at the design of database, okay, there are three aspects you can think about. You, would, you want to have a decentralized database. You want to have a scalable database, i.e. Um, contains a lot of information and, and, and can, can increase in size very easily, or you want to have a secure database. Most traditional databases that we work with, you know, SQL database and so on, is very scalable. Excel database, very scalable. It is also very secure, but that security resides with the service provider. That's not decentralized, right? Because you, you're trusting Microsoft, um, you know, a cloud to, to back up and encrypt that information for you. But if you don't trust them to do that encryption for you, you want to go for decentralized approach, Great, so you do the distributed ledger technology, have everyone keep separate copies of that as backups of each other. And if there's any disagreement, we'll find agreement among potential disagreements inside. That's decentralization. But if you want to have decentralized and also scalable, a really big database, right? And also decentralized, maybe there are vulnerabilities. People can actually you know, make unauthorized changes without you being able to, to, to um, detect that or do something with that. So if you want to have scalable and decentralized database, maybe security won't be as tight as you, as you want it to be. You want to have decentralized and also very secure because you don't want people to compromise this database at all. You probably have to sacrifice scalability. So Bitcoin and, and Ethereum blockchains are built based on this philosophy. Alternative blockchains we see later, like Solana, Avalanche, and so on, uh, they don't really mind so much about decentralization, right? Another aspect of decentralization is, okay, I want to have everyone okay, keep backup of copies. But if I want to limit okay, people who can back up the copies, so just people who can have supercomputers with really large databases, a very fast processing capability, then is that really decentralization? Because on the other aspect of decentralization, it could mean that, hey, this blockchain can actually be run on a, a, a mobile phone. Right. If anyone has a mobile phone, you can be part of maintaining the blockchain and also mine the blockchain as well. If your philosophy of this, your philosophy of blockchain design favors this kind of decentralization, increasing access to everyone, then you might not be able to have that scalability because you know how fast can a mobile phone be, how big a database can a mobile phone store, and so on and so on. So these are the designs. People call this the the blockchain trilemma is actually Vitalik Buterin, who's the founder, one of the co-founders of uh, Ethereum blockchain that popularized this idea. So sometimes people refer to this as the um, uh, uh, Vitalik's trilemma as well, or Buterin's trilemma, depending on whether you want to call them on the second uh, surname instead or not. And this is also the limitations. Okay, because um, the, the early blockchains weren't really designed for this kind of traffic. A lot of congestion comes. If you look at the uh, gas price, right? this is a, a chart of gas price in the past in units of gigaway. Huawei is actually gigaway. Um, in 2020, it spiked when DeFi was, was uh, very popular. Yeah. Because prior to that, there weren't a lot of places for you to, to you know, there weren't a lot of, a lot of applications on the Ethereum network for you to be spending your gas on. Then suddenly around mid 2020, people got, got caught into this DeFi rush. People wanted to use all these smart contracts. So they had to pay all these gas. And um, if you want to outcompete other people because sometimes speed actually means the ability to make profit, then you pay gas to outbid other people. Then the network became really expensive. I say expensive quote unquote, because today is even more expensive than that, right? But back then, 
we were talking about a, a dollar worth. Sorry, we're making transfers maybe cost you less than a dollar, right? And increase to like five dollars, people were complaining. And now it's thirty dollars, and people are like, oh, that's a norm. So you know, people get desensitized a little bit. And because of this, right, Binance actually had a blockchain itself, but Binance was built on like Bitcoin architecture. It didn't really have, didn't really have um a block uh, a smart contract capability. They saw this. Okay, they saw this rise in gas price. They saw this rise in popularity of DeFi. They decided, okay, they launched that chain in April 2020. Okay, and in September, they said, oh, from this point onward, our, our, our blockchain now can run smart contracts. What they say is we ditched the old version. If you want to go with uh, Binance smart chain, please don't run the old software, run the new software instead. The old version will be invalidated. Let's use this new one instead. This new one is based. I say based because it's really just a fork of Ethereum. And they change some parameters around. And they change the block size. Uh, they limit the people who can participate. Right? Not everyone can be nodes inside a block the Binance Smart Chain. But by doing that, all their nodes are supercomputers, not like you know um, old laptops that Ethereum blockchain was built to accommodate. So you have you know, nodes of all these big supercomputers, really fast, really big. You can actually increase the block size a lot. It's very fast. You can reduce the gas fee as well. And that's how Binance Smart Chain became popular, right? Because of this, this um, gas price uh, increase in 2020. If you go back to this page, it means um, if you want to use, say, Binance Smart Chain, you are you're not that worried about decentralization, okay? They are able to reduce that gas price. They're able to reduce the block size because they favor scalability and security, making it a little bit closer to centralized database, okay? But still decentralized to a certain extent. But if you really worry about decentralization that anyone must be able to participate, you will never be able to achieve what Binance Smart Chain does. So it's a matter of philosophy. It became a big debate around 2020 when participants inside the world were people who were, who were um, uh, tech enthusiasts and they had their, their philosophy of how to build these blockchains and so on. But from perspectives of user, this choice of reducing decentralization means they can reduce gas to almost nothing. So if you're just looking for you know, transactions with low, tra with, with low fees, then this is how they do it, right? That's a reason why certain chains have high fees because they have different design philosophy compared to others. All right, and because of this, right, the popularity in the low fee chains, people, people sometimes hold them alternate chains, alternate, alternative chains, right? Uh, Ethereum recognized this, that at some point, this network is gonna be so congested. So we have to think about solutions to expand that capacity. They uh, generally they call this L2, layer two, right? A layer two essentially means let's have another blockchain that is compatible with this original blockchain, but it's going to, it, it's going to ease the congestion, right? The old system is so congested. So let's build new roads that's, that's connected to the old roads. So more people can use this network. And this becomes known as the L2, right? Or layer two protocols, the different technologies of um, introducing this extra capacity. Uh, there are some additional capacity being built by Ethereum themselves. There are also other additional capacity being built by people who make their blockchains compatible to Ethereum. Like, oh, uh, you use the same programming language. If you use this, this address on Ethereum blockchain, when you come to our blockchain, your address remains the same. So come over here, it's very easy to use. Polygon Matic is one example, right? This is People call this an L2 chain of Ethereum, but whether that's official or not is debatable. They make themselves compatible for Ethereum because they want the user base of Ethereum to migrate over to them. Ethereum is also building their own layer two as well, right? And that's what an L2 means, right? That's the original blockchain here, Ethereum, that people realize that it's really popular. Let's ride on this popularity, build more capacity, but who's building them? Is it the same guys or is it the new guys? That's the L2 part. There's also what's called the Alt L1, Alternative L1. So these are blockchains that are designed using, uh, designed to be competing blockchains. A Binance Smart Chain is a competition to Ethereum blockchain. Um, Solana blockchain 
Avalanche blockchain, there are competitions to Ethereum blockchain. Some of them work on different programming language. They may go with Rust instead of Solidity, for example, right? And um, people would call this the different aspects, right? The L1 wall, the L1 wall would be Ethereum versus Solana versus Avalanche, competing blockchains. And the L2 wall would be different scaling solutions of you know, Polygon, Matic, and any other techniques to make themselves that additional capacity compatible with Ethereum blockchain. Because a lot of capital is tied up in Ethereum blockchain, right? If you look at how much a market cap Ethereum blockchain has, uh, it remains one of the, one of the um, actually it remains the dominant smart contract chain right now. That's why people want to build their, their solutions to be compatible to where the money is. Right, let's see how we're doing with time. It is 10.09, uh, I'm gonna take a break at around 10.20, okay? So the first few slides, I go very, very slowly in terms of the speed of progression of slides because I want to give you the foundation of how the structural organization of the blockchain works so that you would see that when you integrate all these codes, how do they come together to end up providing you with financial services in the end? Now that you see that um, you can write anything inside your own address, including you can write numbers inside your own address, you can essentially create um, tradable, a transferable digital information inside your address. Because if it's transferable, it means you can sell them, right? Transferable means tradable by definition. So the first type that we saw earlier on the right-hand side is called a fungible token. ERC stands for Ethereum Request for Comment. Okay, um, this is a collaborative kind of open source-ish development where people would send out proposals, and EIP, Ethereum Improvement Proposal, if I recall correctly, to the community, right? People would see, people would comment, and people would uh, say, okay, this looks great. Let's, let's adopt this as a standard of how we write codes and how we do things on this blockchain. And ERC-20 standard came from a proposal that say, look, there's a type of a set, okay, a set of a, a set of instructions you can write inside your address so that once you have all these lists of instructions, you can have tradable numbers. You can create them upfront you can allow other people to create more numbers. You can allow people to transfer those numbers or you can allow people to destroy those numbers as well. The minting and burning means creating new tokens and destroying old tokens, right? If you imagine usage, it's like when you go to food court, right? You exchange your cash for the food court coupons. And once they collect your food court coupons, um, they will come back. The vendors will come back to the, to the uh, food court operator to exchange those cash voucher for actual cash, and then they're done. The, those cash vouchers that have been redeemed, they will just destroy them, they will just burn them. So you can think of the process of creating those food court tokens as a minting process, and the process of destroying the, the used up food court tokens as a burning process. This is called an ERC-20 standard, and it allows you to create numerical values. We call them fungible tokens, but they're not essentially tokens, right? They're, they're because there are no units, like tangible tokens that you can that you can uh, you can really visualize. They're just numbers that we saw earlier that could be that that exist in fractions, which you can decide how many decimal places you want your fractions to be, and you can subtract and add this information on the ledger on the balance of other addresses that decide to interact with your contract. Okay, so. You can imagine a lot of uses of numbers, right? and we're going to talk about them throughout our class. The other type is called non-fungible token. Now, this one actually has a bound, has like you know conceptualization to it. A fungible token is like food court vouchers, but not vouchers anymore. They're numbers that can be used like food court vouchers. So today, when you go to food courts, they don't give you they don't give you a cash. Uh, voucher in terms of paper anymore, right? They will give you a card that has a balance on it. The balance on the food court card is fungible tokens, right? That happen to have a one-to-one -one exchange value to, to a bar price. 
a non-fungible token on the other hand is like a digital boundary box you can think of this as a a cell on a, on a spreadsheet that you can transfer the cell the ownership of the cell itself okay to other people okay this is what a non-fungible token is think of it as a piece of paper okay you can write unique information on it and you can transfer that piece of information around whatever you write on it is up to you right but there are pieces of paper which are transferable you can write a blank piece of paper nothing on it and give it to other people if they're willing to pay for this fine okay fair game and the standard for this is called erc721 erc721 is um, one paper okay one id and this becomes problematic because it actually costs a lot of gas uh, this ERC seven two one contains a lot of information inside. Okay, if you want to if you want to put in something meaningful like a link to your artwork, a link to music, for example, you have to write that link inside the blockchain, and that's going to cost you gas. If you want to create ten pieces of artwork of exactly the same thing, I want to have ten in my collection of exactly the same things. You have to pay gas ten times to create ten tokens. So ERC one one five five. Okay, it is what people call a semi-fungible token or a hybrid token. This allows you to create a mix of information, right? There's one unique information. This is my artwork. This is the ID of my artwork. This is a link to the, um, you know, the digital storage box that contains the information of my artwork. And there are 10 of these boxes. So you pay gas one time, but there are 10 units of the same box. And this saves you gas tremendously okay, we're, gonna, we're gonna see the use case in in um, some of metaverse applications in a moment right so we talked a lot about the binance solana polygon already so let me um, go to this if you want to imagine um, how to use a blockchain right and blockchain is essentially a database that connects um, numerical or digital information that has potential value to other people you can think about creating um, an e-commerce business based on tokens so I want to sell something. Let's tokenize my product, right? We have product creator, we have a product, create this. So let's tokenize this. I can, I can make it so that to buy this product, I'm not accepting money, okay? I'm accepting other tokens only. Send me token X, I will send you the product token. Okay, and then this, this becomes, this becomes the, um, this becomes the, uh, I guess, the, the money kind of token. Okay. I can use my own, sorry, I, I can use somebody else's token to, ex, to, to buy, to accept for these products. Like I can accept Bitcoin. If you give me Bitcoin, I'll give you my product. Or I can say, no, I will not accept Bitcoin. Please exchange it to some, some other coin first. And then you can use that coin to buy my product. Okay, so this now is like a food court. I can pay cash, the food court vendor, but no. I make a rule so that if you want to buy food from food court vendor, you have to use food court vouchers. Okay, but notice that that's the rule that's only enforceable at the first time, a primary sale. If you want to go and buy directly from a food court vendor, you better have those vouchers. But if somebody else buys food from a food court vendor and then you, know, you come to the seating area and say, hey, I bought this for 50 baht, but they just ran out. Would you like to buy it from me for 100 baht? you can settle in any money, any tokens that you want, right? So this enforcement of which means of payment that you want to use is actually enforceable only at the primary sale because then you control the supply. But when that supply becomes uh, publicly owned, the owner of that supply can you know, choose whatever denomination, whatever currency or whatever means of payment they feel comfortable with to, to exchange for that, right? So this is an example. Crypto Kitties actually was created in 2017. Each kitty is an NFT. It contains the digital information that is unique to this uh, cat. And maybe the cat grows over time. I don't know. Uh, they may reflect this information of the cat that grows over time visually on the website. Okay? But inside the blockchain, that token, nothing changes since the day this token is created. Right. Once this token is created, you can't go back and change anything inside anymore. So typically, people will just put in the ID of the cat inside the token, and then they would maintain a separate database outside the blockchain that updates that, oh, this cat ID 528615 now has evolved into a really uh, ferocious cat. 
really cute cat and so on. When you first bought it, it was just an egg and then it grows into some you know, formidable beast. That is not on the blockchain. Okay? The only thing that's on the blockchain is the ID of this creature, which um, you, know, you update using other methods all the time. Why is this? Because blockchain is immutable in the sense that once you record something, okay, sorry, it's irreversible. Let me change my word. It's irreversible. If you put in information that, oh, this cat looks like this on the blockchain directly itself, the cat can only look like this forever. Okay? It can't change appearance anymore. So people will just put in you know, the relevant information. And also to put in the whole of this cat as digital pixels on a blockchain, it's going to cost you a ton of money. Right? Because remember, one blockchain, so one block of blockchain is about, I think for... Let me, let's, let's see this for ourselves. Let's see this for ourselves. One block on this either scan it gives you information. Okay, one block has about 85. I have to divide it by 1024, right? Maybe 80 kilobytes. This cat is probably 80 kilobytes. The cat that we saw here, it's probably about 80 kilobytes. So this cat itself will take up the content of the entire block of blockchain. You have to compete with other people who really want to record information and some of that might include, oh, this is a billion dollar transfer, which costs maybe only a few hundred bytes, but you want to put 80,000 bytes on there by all means. So pay the gas. Right? So that's why people just put, oh, let, let me just put down 528614 then. That's enough. Then the rest will just handle off the blockchain. So if, even if you have blockchain, you do need open internet because you cannot run everything on a blockchain completely. That is just impossible, right? Because it will cost you so much gas, it will bankrupt you. So this is a, an example of an on-chain product, right? Because if you made a product token, I can tokenize anything, right? I can, I, you know, um, yeah, I can tokenize coffee. If you own this token, yeah, you have the ability to exchange this token for a cup of cup, a cup of coffee freshly brewed by world barista, world champion barista. Great. So I go to the barista and say, here, here's the NFT, here's a token. Can you please brew the coffee for me? And he was like, no. Why do you need to do that? I don't even know that I'm obliged to do that to you. Right. The blockchain does not guarantee this. The blockchain guarantees that you own the token, but what that token can do for you. I don't know, right? Especially if it involves transactions that are off the blockchain. So on the flip side, if everything is on the blockchain and all you want to know is once I buy this, okay, I own this cat, I own this ID to this cat. And if that is considered transaction complete, then using the blockchain is fantastic because nobody can take this cat away from you anymore. Actually, to be more accurate, nobody can take this ID away from you. Right? You now are a proud owner of 528614, which if they still maintain their website, okay, would map you with this picture of a cat. But if they decide to take down okay, the, the, um, you know, the service altogether, yes, you still own 528614, but that is not usable anywhere. You can sell it to other people that, hey, I once owned 528614 that used to represent this picture of a cat, but now the service provider is gone. Um, would you like to buy this? So if people would like to buy that, then you know, it's transferable because it's, it's just a piece of information in the blockchain that gives you the right to transfer to other people. So you can always ask for money in exchange for transferring that to them. So also CryptoPunks, I'm not gonna, not gonna spend time on this, you guys know. And um, what if, if you're a creator, right? And you want to sell on this platform, think of this as like a platform um, economics question, platform design. Um, I, I'm, I'm selling food. Why should I go with Food Panda versus Grab, you know, versus Line Man? I don't know, maybe, maybe there are more, more customers on there. Oh, by the way, but if you sell with me, right, I'm going to give you some incentive. Yeah, how? I'm going to give you 0% GP for the first three months. So, you know, uh, I'm not going to take any cut of the revenue that you get at all. Are you going to make a loss? Yeah, sure. You know, the, the riders, it's going to cost money, but I'm not going not gonna to charge you anything for now because I want you to get a feel of what it's like to sell on my platform. I'm going to give you subsidy. And that's what you do. 
for usual platform businesses. They give you subsidies. So I could do that. I could do that. Okay. What I could also do is, oh, I'm a platform. Uh, you want to, once you sign up to our platform, I'm going to give you maybe, you know, with, let's not use a real company. Otherwise, I may run, get, run into trouble. Okay. Suppose I, I run a food delivery company called, called um, Super K or something, right? Okay. If you sign up with us and you become our, our merchant, I'm going to give you a Super K coins to thank you okay, for being part of the system. And you're a merchant, like, okay, great, thanks. You, you gave me Super K coins, but how, where do these coins come from again? Oh, I created them. I created them from my platform capability because this is my information, right? From the perspective of this uh, blockchain, all you have to do is pay gas. Then you can create those tokens. And once you put everything together, you can actually you now have a, an ecosystem where you have payment tokens. You want to buy my product, you got to use my own payment token, buy my um, K dollar coin, K baht coin. With K baht coin, you can buy my K food products. Okay. And for people who participate, I'm going to give you K reward coin. To simplify things, I might just say, oh, instead of having K dollar coin and K reward coin, I can just combine them the two together. That's fine. But I might not want to include these reward token as part of the payment because with payment, there's a money aspect to it. Right? With the reward token, I can always make more of those tokens to give to other people. Like airline miles, for example. This is a bit like airline miles. They give you miles. But um, the value comes from the fact that they, they give you the ability to redeem the miles or something. But if they give you miles and they say, and they say yes, uh, the miles are there for you to, to, feel, to feel proud of being our participants. But uh, I'm, I regret to inform you that those miles are not redeemable for anything at all. You are free to send miles to people who you love. You're free to buy and sell miles among yourself. But from the perspective of our relationship with you, those miles do not confer any right to you at all. So we give you those miles to reward you for your loyalty, for your uh, continued patronship in our service, but that is, that's it. That's all we're giving you. Okay. So as you can see now, this is essentially what tokens are. Um, digital information, which all you have to do is pay gas to create. There are types of information which cost more gas to create, but all you have to do really is just to pay gas. Then you get it. Okay, and then I skip this. Um, but well, uh, quickly that you can actually uh, create NFTs by just yeah by just using um, a website applications like this and uh, pay gas and then you're done. I was doing this part of a radio show, see radio to show that you can really create NFTs. All you have to do is pay gas. You can set the price to whatever you want, but whether people buy that from you or not is another issue. Okay. So this begs the question of then who owns the smart contract, right? If I write the contract, I own the contract, then, hey, wait a minute. Then if, if I own the contract, I write that contract myself, why would I, why would other people trust the contract that I write? So you have to think about increasing the confidence to other people that, you know, these contracts don't just come out of thin air. Somebody has to write them. Can you trust people who write them to write them in a way that is not out there to take advantage of other people. So sometimes you house them together in a formal organization, a decentralized autonomous organization or DAO. They use the word decentralized autonomous cooperative uh, earlier too, but I think that that doesn't sound as catchy as DAO. So they leave it at DAO. A decentralized application is a connection of all these addresses that contains smart contracts that interact in a way that provide you with services without the need for human to, to, to do anything. Because a human or a group of humans have already written the instructions inside those addresses to dictate the rules of engagement on the blockchain. So, you know, um, metaverse, decentral land, to the example of this, uh, ecosystem that we, we said, that's payment token, reward token. So what's the payment token for Decentraland? You have to buy mana. Why do you need mana? Because when they auction off the land, the land is a ERC721 NFT token. And in order for you to buy land inside this 
decentralized um, application. You have to use Mana token, right? You can't buy with ETH. You can't buy Bitcoin. You can't buy with any other stable coins. If you do have them, exchange them to Mana first, and then you can use Mana to buy this rare land NFT. Um, Sandbox, okay, they have their own ERC20 token, Sand. This is their payment token because if you want to buy digital assets at the first time, a primary sale from the creators, you must pay Sand. You can't pay using anything else. Contrast this with early example. Okay, when you wanted to buy um, CryptoPunk, you pay in ETH. These three lines is, is um, a capital letter uh, E epsilon in Greek. So this is a symbol for Ethereum as a currency in this world. When you want to buy crypto, um, crypto kitties, you pay ETH as well. They didn't bother creating a payment token for you to buy all these products because they're willing to accept the, the, the popular uh, denomination of Ether already. But you can also always right, dictate people to use your own token to buy, but only in the primary sale. Once I am able to buy land, once I'm able to buy the digital equipment inside the game already, when I resell, I'm free to resell in any denomination that I like. If you're playing online games, MMORPG games, right? you can do, online, you can do trading with people using in-game stuff, or I can say, I can negotiate with the, the gamers in the outside world and say, hey, look, you have really good equipment. I want to buy this from you. I want to pay you 100,000 baht. And, and you're going to have to give me that equipment in game. Deal? If that's the case, that can also happen. It doesn't have to happen using any currency in game at all. Right? Same thing. So this is to show you that when you want to mint tokens, you need a set of these functions. And the ERC20 standard is a collection of eight smart contract functions that the first one, my token, allows you to name your token. Okay, I wanted to create super K coin. This function allows you to name it super K coin. And I can mint it and mint it for myself. This before giving it to other people, I can transfer it. A proof is allowing other people to interact with my contract. Let's burn. That was transfer from, that's also burn from. All you need is these eight, con these eight uh, commands written inside one Ethereum address. Now you have an ERC20 token smart contract address, which you can distribute to anyone that, I, that you want. I can give you know, all, how many of you are, are here today? All 33 of you, a commemorative um, NFT, okay, one unique each, that's gonna cost me an arm and a leg if I do it on Ethereum network. I can, I can uh, mint 33 units using ERC20 and give you guys one unit each. That's also going to give you evidence that you guys participate in this class, but the data structure and the cost of gas involved is going to be a little different. Okay, so let me take a break here until 10.40 and then we will resume. I'm going to report recording so it's not too long. So during break, I received a question of what does it mean uh, to be minting? So uh, historically, a mint is a place where you would make new coins. Right? In the old days where people still use precious metal as coins, you would have to melt the gold bullion or the silver bullion into coins for convenience of use. So a mint would be a place where you do that exactly. Right? And over time, uh, it became associated with the process of creating uh, money the, the vocabulary adopted by, by the blockchain people uh, wants to draw on the analogy that people are familiar with. So the word tokens and so on, and also minting came exactly from that, right? So when you mint a token, what you do is you conjure this number up into existence. Uh, the, the process on the blockchain will be associated with transferring from a zero x, zero, 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 zero address and rest with basically 40 zeros at the end. This is, this is called a mint and burn address. You can think of it as a whole where you conjure up numbers if you want to make it 
uh, you want to conjure this into existence. And if, if you're done with that number, you don't want that number to exist on a blockchain anymore, you send that number into that hole, the burn, there's the same address where you conjure it up from, you end up burning that token. Okay, so that's, that's what minting means in this case. So um, you could write a smart contract that mints token automatically for you, right? You can, this is sometimes called a faucet. Uh, you go to this address, you send, you send a, a, an instruction to that address, that address will create token and send to your, to your, uh, to your wallet. And now you're a proud owner of that. A faucet is yeah, when, you, when, you go to the, when you go to the kitchen sink, you want water, you turn on the faucet and the water flows. That's that analogy. You can also make it conditional that if you don't send me this token, or send me token X, I will then send you token Y, which I create out of thin air. Then that's, that's a, a possible condition for you to receive a minted token as well. Here they have a fixed supply ERC20 token. What this means is there's no mint function. Nobody can make any more of these tokens. A mintable ERC20 contract means you have the additional uh, mint capability inside that, or nobody else is allowed to mint the token anymore after the original mint that you that you did as part of the contract creation. So this means once you have numbers, you can transfer, you can exchange money for the privilege of receiving that token. You can use this as a fundraising mechanism. In the past, when people used these tokens or coins to raise funds, it was as early as 2013 or so where, where people started introducing more blockchains onto the world. And the, the early ICOs were associated with a group of developers creating a new blockchain altogether. And they promised that, hey, if you come to this, part, to this blockchain, we're going to have pre-allocation for you. Instead of starting from zero, maybe our blockchain numbers um, we call this native coin, by the way, um, Bitcoin and Ether uh, are called native coin because they are created as part of blockchain maintenance process through the, through the mining process. And these would be typically what people would refer to as coins because they come from the, they come from the original uh, function of mining uh, through the blockchain. And then the, the things that you mint here, people tend to use the word tokens instead of coins. For popular use, coins and tokens are used interchangeably, but technically speaking, coin is reserved for the native coins of that blockchain. The ones you use to pay gas with, the one that you can mine from uh, providing your resources to the network. And then everything else are tokens because they are created as part of smart contracts. In the old days, when they say initial coins offering, they really meant coins because they created new blockchains and say, hey, come to this blockchain. We're going to start off with, with maybe uh, 5 million. You know, we off, we got offering, we're going to be offering up a million for sale. The other 4 million are held by the developers and the early backers. So you would pay them, right? Maybe send Bitcoin to them. And then they're going to send, the, they're going to send you an address on this new blockchain that contains the coins already. People call this a pre-mined coins because this wasn't part of the mining process. Bitcoin on the other hand was everything mined, right? I think if I recall correctly, you mined it, but the early miners, there were nobody. So, so um, it, it, the early users got a lot of the coins, but for new blockchains, the pre-mines are the allocations given to people even before the first block was mined like the Genesis block, they call it. So that's the ICO in the past. It became really, diff uh, it was a bit more difficult to sell the coins then because it involves not just selling coins, but it involves enlisting people to maintain this blockchain network. Until around 2000 and I'm not sure the years exactly, 2017, uh, Ethereum was launched in, 2013? No, no. I don't really know, know the dates exactly. But, but they created this ERC20 standard. Once they created this ERC stand, uh, ERC20 standard, creating numbers becomes a lot easier because you don't need to maintain a separate blockchain for those numbers anymore. You can just go to Ethereum blockchain and say, there are a lot of Ethereum nodes already that are maintaining the system. All I have to do is to create numbers in my own address through the minting process here. And then I can sell them in exchange for money. And that's the initial coin offering. 
Then people started realizing when you sell these tokens, you, did you promise them something like uh, a share of future profit? Did you promise them participation, like voting for certain, certain company actions? If that's the case, that looks a lot like security, doesn't it? If it's, a, if it's a security, then we have security laws already. You know, security laws were written in the past when there was no computer. And when there's a computer, everything is digitized, you are still using the same security laws. So now that you're using blockchain to do this, what gives you the exemption from securities law? So certain offerings that look like securities have to be registered as securities. A security token offering would then refer to the offering of tokens created using ERC-20 standards like this, but you as a creator also promise security-like benefits to the buyer. So you have to register with the SEC. Thailand also has that procedure as well. Right, so you're making a distinction between a blank coin, a, to a blank token, blank coin that has no, no implicit backing versus the ones that do have a security like backings. IEO uh, initial exchange offering refers to the, the next phase in, in um, digital asset trading. Let me use the word digital asset for, to, to, to stand for all this. The next phase in digital asset trading where in the past, everything was peer to peer. If I wanted Bitcoin, what I had to do was I have to post on internet web board and say, I want to buy 10 Bitcoins. Could someone sell 10 Bitcoins to me? Then you have to do this, um, this exchange using whatever method you do, right? Maybe you have to compromise your anonymity and whatnot. So it, it's really difficult. And then digital asset exchanges sprung up. So in our context, BitCup, right? Um, Sipmex would be uh, uh, Coinbase, Binance would be examples of asset exchanges. This, this makes trading easy because it reflects the way stock markets work. People are used to this already. And the stock market is great because it allows strangers to interact with each other, uh, coordinated by the centralized exchange here. So when you want to offer new tokens to other people and you use the exchanges to, to help you distribute and trade the tokens, this is called an initial exchange offering. In the past where you were offering coins, everything was done like peer to peer. So people, some people weren't familiar with that. And then around 2019, 2020, um, venues where you can start trading, move toward decentralized venues. We'll cover that next time. Right? If the first time you start offering tokens for people to buy and sell, it is not through digital asset exchanges, but through decentralized liquidity pools. We call this initial DEX offering or initial decentralized exchange offering. There are activities like farming. This is putting your liquidity inside a liquidity pool in order to receive profits, right? If they give you the tokens as profits, as benefits by participating in this liquidity pool, this is called initial farm offering because you have to farm your tokens in order to receive these tokens as reward. So these two are DeFi concepts which we'll talk about next time. And these are how you can use tokens for fundraising. I may want to use fundraising quote unquote because um, there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of levels of commitments you have in fundraising. Crowdfunding, for example, sometimes uh, you expect nothing in return, like crowd donation. People call that fundraising too. So there's a, a variety of degrees of the responsibilities associated with a fundraiser and the person who provide the funds. And the most important part of regulation typically is to make sure that when you communicate the expectations, that is a truthful representation of the commitment. If you tell them that, hey, I'm gonna give you profit, but by, by, by virtue of the way you're structuring this agreement, there's no guarantee that you ever provide a profit. Even if you have profit, you might not have to legally provide profit, then that's called misrepresentation, right? That's why security laws uh, are pretty particular about if you make these type of representations, you better, be, you better make sure you're able to follow through because if you can't, this is a security fraud and um, investors can sue you for this.
So even if we have decentralized exchanges to trade, decentralized exchanges remain a very popular place for you to, to trade at the moment. But you know, this may change over time because we start seeing the encroachments of the regulations of traditional finance into centralized exchanges. Decentralized exchange is a fully deregulated place. Deregulated might not be the right word, might be the word un unregulated, might be the better word because, you know, who is the authority, who is the entity providing the service? Where is that entity um, located? What jurisdiction, what, what laws do we even use to enforce, in, to enforce a rules and standards on them? So decentralized exchanges um, tend, to be, tend, tend, tend to be places where a lot of things can happen. The reason why people like um, using centralized exchanges is because a lot of people are familiar with the experience that the, that the centralized exchanges offer. So there was a research uh, called the Coinbase effect. This, this looks at the, the token price once it lists on Coinbase, right? Um, as you might expect, um, if you list on exchange with ha which have a lot of user bases, it gives you a lot of liquidity. Therefore, you might expect that stock prices, oh no, no, not stock, sorry. The token prices that list on those exchanges go up more. So Messari is a crypto research company. They did a cumulative performance five years after listing at several exchanges. And what they found was that listing at Coinbase has, has a statistically significant impact of, of um, higher performance once they list on there. Right, so now that you understand the, con the, the structure of all these, uh, where did decentralization of finance come from? To one extent, uh, the creation of Bitcoin came out as a response to, to the centralized structure of financial system. When we make payments, there are lots of fees, there are lots of rules, especially when you try to jump from one country to another. So it was pretty inefficient. But by having Bitcoin or having a blockchain, anyone can maintain direct connection between their, their wallets. So if, you are con if you're able to directly connect to somebody else's wallet, all you have to do is to offset the numbers, right? Reduce 10 from my wallet, increase 10 in your wallet. There's not a lot of frictions associated with that anymore because you, we are all on the same ledger. We're all on the same database. But the old financial system was built in a very weird way. You can think of each one as having their own spreadsheet. Bank A has its own spreadsheet. Bank B has its own spreadsheet. It has to talk to each other without revealing the whole content of each other's information database. At the very least, it has to prove that A, the person A is sending to person B. Bank B has to prove person A who wants to send the fund exists. Bank A also has to prove person B who's receiving the funds exists. That's level one. You, have to, you also have to prove that um, uh, person A does have the fund to, to, uh, to send because how do I give okay, person, uh, person B the money if person A doesn't have the money to send and so on and so on. Right? So there's a lot of frictions in the traditional system because it is a different database that you have to cross over. The blockchain solves this trivially because in, a, in the blockchain system, everyone is on the same database and everyone sees the content so I do know this address exists. I do know that the, the address that sends, um, sends tokens does have the, uh, the tokens on hand because it is the person who sent that has to check with the network that yes, verify the network, yes, I do have the tokens that, I, that, that is enough to send to person B because if I don't have enough tokens, that transaction won't go through. So it's a very easy fix. That was a wave one of decentralized finance, but that's, that's only one part. Because if you look at what the financial system does, it does, it does a lot of things without us knowing it. Right? Um, level one, the financial system does asset custody. If we have a lot of money, we can either choose to keep that money at home and then not sleep very well or not work very well during the day because you don't know when you're not home, somebody might come and steal your, your, your wealth. So you leave it with depository institutions like banks or you, you leave it... Uh, you leave it in other forms like stocks and bonds. And then you ask the Thailand security depository to hold those, uh, those uh, scripts on your behalf. 
that's asset custody. It provides you with convenience. Right? It also provides you with the ability for you to transfer across different types of, of assets uh, across different people. Um, we call this payments and exchange, right? A payment is essentially a moving money from one person to another person. Exchange is moving money or one asset class into another asset class. So it's a movement, a contemporaneous uh, movement that occurs today across different accounts, across different identities, across different forms of assets. And the third is called capital allocation, where you're trying to allocate across, um, across time, right? It's an investment for future productivity. I know that once you do this business, you're going to hit it off and be really rich. I hope so. I hope so. But you don't have the money today. So can I fund your investment? The investment itself might be risky. There may be a lot of things associated with information that's being provided. Um, lies, misrepresentation, frauds, and, and um, swindles, and so on and down the line. But we have a few ways of solving this, and we have a few institutions that help us do this. Commercial banking is one, but we have um, capital market investment banking activities. We have asset management companies that do things on our behalf. Insurance companies might even be viewed as a capital allocation uh, exercise because we are allocating money from when we are healthy toward when we are not very healthy. It is a very targeted form of allocating capital across different possible states of the world. Now, these are the four, uh, the, the three functions. What about the problems and frictions? I mean, asset custody transfer and exchange, use, it should be easy, but the reason why it's not is because we have multi-systems. Each people, each entity has its own database and it doesn't want to compromise the, the, um, the proprietariness of the information or the privacy of customers by revealing everything to other people who aren't associated. Uh, we also have um, responsibilities associated with uh, proof of identity, anti-money laundering, um, combating finance, financial activities of terrorism, and so on. And we also have the, the trust placed upon us as custodian of assets as well. Sometimes you may have to hire trustees right, to make sure that the assets really exist. If you buy mutual funds, part of the fees that go toward management of future funds uh, toward the trustee fees because the trustee have to make sure that the fund management company actually safeguards your, your money really well. So those are the, the, the problems and frictions in the old system. So this leads to network uh, maintenance and compliance costs that, adds, that, 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 that um, adds up to the cost of providing services. Blockchain might be a good way to solve this because everything is visible for you to see. Um, custodianship, as long as you see that this information is on your, on your um, address, then you can be sure that this is yours. There's a saying in the crypto world, not your keys, not your coins. Because if this information is not stored inside your address, which is created by your private key, and you and you alone has access to that private key to sign all the transactions, then you can't really trust that it's really yours. Because if you ask the exchange to keep that coins for you and the exchange goes down, maybe that's not yours anymore. Maybe the coins that you keep at the exchange don't even exist, right? Because an exchange is its own database system. It can credit your account with Bitcoin, but in fact, you have no Bitcoin to your name in a blockchain world. So not your keys, not your coins mean if you don't, have ownership to that address and that address does not contain those tokens, they're not exactly yours. On the flip side, if you have access to that private key and you see it there, nobody can take that away from you, right? And there was a question earlier, right? What happens if you use a private key? Well, then nobody can ever take that information out of that wallet ever again through the end of time. So that's the... That's a price you pay, right? For this absoluteness in that's this finality in ownership. And then nobody else can help you. If you use the traditional financial system, they're the custodians. If you forget your password to your account, for example, you can always reset your password if you jump through a few identification hoops. You can even allow other people to transact on your behalf, right? You can sign, 
you can sign a letter that authorizes this person to transact up to this amount on your behalf, and that's it. But if you use a private key, you have to do everything yourself because if you give the private key to someone else, this means you give them control of everything in that wallet and every other wallet that are connected to that private key as well. Those problems are the problems for asset custody transfers and exchanges, right? If you, the, the gist of the problem is if you share the database, there's no big problem. But the fact is that the financial system comprises a lot of unconnected databases. So we have financial intermediaries who help us jump or coordinate across databases in a way that, that still retains data integrity and, and security. The capital allocation contains a few more problems, right? Because we have the uncertain nature of future investment. Sometimes you may have maturity mismatch. Um, I am willing to fund your investment for three years, but you need 30 year capital. Well, sorry, then in that case, um, I don't think I, I can wait 30 years because I'll be dead by then. So you have to find somebody else to do that instead. The um, asset management companies, commercial banking companies, they, they transform the maturity. You know, they buy, they buy long dated securities and then they issue, they issue a counter securities that have different payoff profile, maybe shorter maturity, higher liquidity, and then they sit in between and then take on that risk. A money market mutual fund or a bond, bond mutual fund, for example, if it's an open-ended bond mutual fund, you can redeem your bonds very easily. But by, by redeeming bonds, the fund actually has to have enough liquidity to, to, to pay for that redemption. Otherwise, if everybody wants to redeem the bonds and there's not enough liquidity in your fund, they're going to have to go and sell that long-dated securities, maybe at a five sale price. And, and this will lead to, to uh, price consequences. Right? There's a lot of research in corporate finance about the five sale that is induced by changes in characteristics of uh, securities that lead to let that lead to um, certain class of securities falling out investor favors and the fire sale would then you know propagate into it into the investors who are connected to those securities via asset management structures like mutual funds for example so this is why right um one side, the asset side, may have some risk profile, and then the financial system transforms that risk profile into, into some, some packages or products that suit the risk profile of the investors. On the other hand, if you're willing to, to bear all those risks, you may be uh, able to have higher returns, higher rewards for that. There's also information asymmetry, which can be classified into two types. Some adverse selection is an ex-ante problem okay, before we engage into contractual relationship. I don't know whether you have a good quality asset or not. Even if you say you have a good quality asset, you could be lying because I can't really tell. So this leads to what's called costly state verification. There's a lot of corporate finance paper written based on this. It means due diligence. right? If you pay... If you pay extra costs, if you exert extra efforts to do due diligence, you might be able to, to tell apart the liars and, and uh, the really good stuff. But in finance, we call this a friction, right? Because in a, a financial market that is supposed to be perfect and function very well, this type of information asymmetry shouldn't exist. Another one is called moral hazard, right? This is an ex-ante ex -ante, uh, problem. We engage in contractual relationship already. I did sufficient due diligence on you. I think I can trust you. But for some reason, after we engage into this contractual relationship, you change your behavior. Now you're no longer the good person I thought you knew. It's a classic problem in insurance as well. When you, when you want to underwrite a customer, you want to tell whether this customer is a good driver or bad driver. So that's the adverse selection. But the next problem comes that when you pick a good driver, that was his behavior when he had no insurance. But now that he has insurance, he doesn't drive as well as before anymore because he knows any problem that comes his way, you're going to cover for him. So he changes behavior. So we have to find ways to make sure that he doesn't change that behavior that he used to be, that, that, that um, we thought him to be. This could be done by governance, monitoring, and so on. All in all, these frictions, 
exist in financial system and the solutions of financial innovation that we see are attempts at trying to navigate all these frictions and um, make sure that any investment opportunities or any transactions that didn't occur because of this friction, okay, the, the difference between the first best allocation versus the second best allocation, we try to correct this by moving our, our outcome in the economy as close to first best allocation as possible. In the context of finance theory, you can think of the Modigliani Miller theorem as the first best allocation. And then we want to see if uh, the frictions that exist in this world affect the way equilibrium allocation looks. What can we do to move the equilibrium allocation in the economy back as close to the first best solution as possible? And that's, that's one way to view the financial system. Now we're going to jump into DeFi. And um, I'm going to introduce you to, to some websites which would give you some visibility into what the offerings of DeFi look like. The first website I put on around there was DeFi Pulse. That used to be good, but then uh, later on, another website, DeFi Lama, came onto the scene. And I think this one does this a little more, a little more elegantly and also has a lot of non-Ethereum DeFi as well. Ethereum was really the Kickstarter behind this DeFi movement because it was the most popular blockchain that allows smart contract capability. But it became a victim of its own success as we saw in the gas graph earlier. It became really expensive to execute smart contracts. So this, this worked against experimental users and small users because your gas fee would eat up everything that you gain. So the other solutions, the other alternate L1s and also L2 solutions started building DeFi products, DeFi protocols as well. Here you can see there are a lot of icons here that look, maybe some of them would look familiar to you. Okay, this diamond shape thing is Ethereum blockchain. This uh, red triangle is Avalanche blockchain and this purple, um, I think it is hex, hex, two hexagonal shapes is Polygon Matic blockchain. So some protocols is built only on Ethereum, right? One single diamond is very common, but there are also other protocols that are built across multiple blockchains. You need to have ways for you to reconcile that the, the assets that exist on one chain cannot be duplicated onto another chain. So, so mechanisms such as bridging allows you to do that. An example of bridging is if I want to if I want to say um, send money from Bangkok to London, I could carry that cash with me onto the plane okay, and then deposit that cash into a London bank. That might constitute a violation of exchange control, right? You can't carry cash with you um, on international travels up to a certain point. Otherwise you would violate. People are worried about things like uh, money laundering and so on. That's why they do that. Another way for you to have money in the London bank account is for you, Okay, to transfer money into someone's account in Bangkok. And then that someone in Bangkok also has an account in London. He is going to transfer his own money in London into your account in London. So now you have less money in Bangkok and more money in London, but money never left Thailand at all. Right? Money in Thailand stayed in Thailand and money in London stayed in London. This is essentially how bridging works. The asset never leaves the chain at all, but it leaves your wallet in this chain and it, enter, it enters your wallet in another chain. This allows you to have assets on the other chain without creating a duplicate on that chain. Right? In Thai, uh, in, we call this service Poi Kuan, right? Maybe that's a Chinese name that uh, was the original name for this, but this is how money transfer, uh, I wouldn't say legal, okay? But this is how money transfer uh, works because this is a transfer without really transferring anything. So you're not essentially violating any exchange regulation. That's how it works. This also tells you that when you talk about uh, money and wealth and so on, there are many ways for you to achieve the same outcome, right? If all you want is to have more money in your wallet, you don't need to carry money around because money in your wallet is just information. If you can... Um, if you can receive that information from someone else and the outcome is the same, you pretty much achieve the goal that you wanted to do. And that's how Bitcoin was intended to work too, right? You, uh, 
if you want money from London and Bangkok, what you can do is you can buy a Bitcoin from someone in Bangkok. Your money leaves your wallet in Bangkok and then you have Bitcoin. Then when you go to London, you sell Bitcoin to someone in London. Now you have money in your wallet in London and money never left uh, Thailand at all. But somehow, right, you have money from London, uh, Bangkok being sent to London through this exchange mechanism. All right. Um, on the left-hand side, it gives you some cl classic classifications of decentralized finance. Let me start first with lending. Lending is exactly as it sounds. Um, you would deposit tokens if you don't need to use them. And if you need to use tokens, you would borrow those tokens with interest, the interest income that you uh, pay to this protocol would then be distributed to people who provided the funding. We're gonna look in detail at Compound um, in the remaining time today. It's one of the earliest uh, lending protocol, but there are also others out there. Typically, when you, look at the, uh, when you look at the market cap of the top five or so, this pretty much accounts for the entire market. So there's a degree of winner takes all kind of in this world as well. This pretty much reflects anywhere in the world, right? People flock to the, the ones that are, that are popular and, and, and successful. There are other websites like the Block and also Glassnode that gives you information on, information on the uh, DeFi and also crypto market. So these are resources for you to look if you're interested. Probably won't have time to go through all these uh, together today. This is a map. Oh, if you are, uh, if you weren't already a DeFi user and you wanted to be uh, in, introduced to the way the protocols work, a YouTube channel called Finematics is good, and I think another one is called the Crypto Whiteboard. So these are the the two YouTube channels that that do the content quite well. At a high level, it's, it, it is a, a good introduction, but if you wanted to get more technical, you probably have to read a documentation of these protocols or follow Medium or Twitter pros instead. Okay, so this is by the block. We saw the name earlier, right? The block also does uh, crypto asset research. So they did, this, they did this infographic around mid of last year. To, to, to document the rise of decentralized finance in 2020. So 2020 was a very busy year. A lot of, a lot of protocols launched their first products around that year and a very crowded manner as well. A lot of innovations, a lot of improvements are being made throughout, uh, the, throughout the, the year. The, the date that people give the most importance to is around late June of 2020, because that's when a protocol, lending protocol compound started distributing their token, which they mint themselves. Prior to that, the, com the, the protocols didn't, didn't give token rewards to users, right? They, they may have their own, the tokens that they mint, but they weren't actively giving it away to other people. There were some other examples of protocols that did this before, maybe a couple of years back, but it didn't really catch wind. 2020 Compound received more interest. And then in order to compete, right, to attract liquidity to the protocol, Compound started giving out these rewards to people who interact in any way. If you deposit reward, okay, if you borrow reward, and the reward became so valuable that people flocked to this protocol just to get the rewards. And then this became um, the, the common mode of growth hacking your protocol. People call this DeFi summer uh, BC, right? BC typically we, we, we use in normal calendar as before Christ era and then um, AD unknown domino, right? Uh, here in DeFi, BC stands for before comp because prior to this comp, comp is a, a token distributed by compound. 
this kind of phenomenon didn't really didn't really uh, happen at all. Right? This this leads to yield farming, which we'll talk about next week, and it is a way for you to earn income, right? additional income on your participation in DeFi. We'll talk about how it works. We'll talk about a potential risk associated with it. Okay, and um, we'll talk about how how to view this from the lens of traditional finance as well. On a high level, despite the way they classify, you know, different websites have different classifications. For me personally, this is this. I don't. I don't want to extend the categories into too many uh, into too many like you know, insurance, uh, hedge funds, yeah, active funds, and so on. I, I want to make it as general as possible. So I think the best way to describe how uh, the use case of DeFi is also how the DeFi protocol works. And the best classification I can, come, can up, can up, I can come up with is four groups. The first is lending. Right? And lending works like banking. You, you deposit. And then that deposit becomes a loanable funds. And then, you know, um, you share the interest. Then that's decentralized exchange. This is a money changing uh, mechanism where if you want to exchange baht for US dollars in the traditional market, there are a few ways you can do this. You can go through the bank of money exchange and then they quote the price, the exchange rate for you. That's one method, okay? That's called a market making. Um, activity by the market makers, the money changes. If there's an open market to, to buy and sell US dollars, like you buy and sell stocks, you can submit your order to buy US dollars at certain exchange rate and the, the volume that you want, then wait to be matched. That's the order book system. Typically, those are the two main ways right, that you can do. You, you go to the exchange waiting to be matched, or you go to someone that... Uh, that stands ready to exchange with you at the quoted price, then they take the risk associated with any price movements. Decentralized exchange changes the way that's done right, by um, uh, combining the anonymity of the order book exchange that we use to buy and sell stocks and also combining the market making, uh, price risk taking, a function of the normal market maker. And this allows you to exchange any assets as long as, as long as they are numerical values on a blockchain, you can actually exchange those numerical values using decentralized uh, algorithm. The third, I call derivatives and, and synthetic assets. Okay, and, and um, to recall what derivatives and synthetics are, for me personally, they're the same thing because a derivative is an asset whose value is derived from some underlying um, underlying uh, notional numerical value or state of the world. An insurance contract is a derivative because when the state of the world reaches a certain pre-specified condition, the contract stipulates that one party pays the other an accident, uh, a rain falls, right? Uh, somebody passes away. As long as you can verify that state, your contingent contract would then dictate that one party pays the other. If you reduce those uh, contingent states to numerical values of states like price, rainfall, even exchange rate, and we, have, we can have things like futures contracts, call options. These are different ways of creating the, the payoff liabilities between the two parties. But they, they bear the resemblance of the value that these contracts uh, derive from depends on whatever you specify as the underlying uh, lookup value. And in extreme case, a, a synthetic asset is an asset that is meant to replicate the payoffs of certain other assets. A depository, a depository receipt, for example, is created by setting up a financial institution to buy the actual stock of a company. Then that financial institution issues a liability that mirrors the cash flow of the actual stock that it holds one-to-one -one and sells it to someone else. That's what a stock depository receipt is. And it's a, it's a synthetic stock created through this process. So what you can do this with with um, any numerical value. So you can, you can uh, use this to create synthetic currency. 
So stable coins are essentially a synthetic, a synthetic asset. So this class number three is actually very big because a lot of the transactions inside the DeFi world involves derivatives and synthetic asset creation. Finally, we have asset management. And there are two types of asset management in this world, right? Passive asset management, you buy um, ETFs, for example, the objective is to track indices. An ETF creation redemption mechanism is allowing somebody to create a, a, a unit, uh, a security unit that is meant to reflect the value and payoffs of a basket of assets. If this synthetic unit trades at a different price compared to the actual basket of, of units, you can arbitrage by creating and redeeming the ETFs. So creation and redemption mechanism in, in a DeFi world is, a, is the, the central mechanism of how derivatives and synthetics number three works. Right? If the price of the synthetic asset or derivatives is out of whack, you can always arbitrage it back into, into parity again. Oh, sorry, um, asset, what I was talking about asset management, right? The asset management part, the passive part shares the insights of the synthetics, sorry. Because uh, when you buy mutual funds, which are passive, when you buy ETFs, these are actually synthetic investments, okay? A synthetic basket of stocks where the person who provides you with asset management service holds the actual stocks and then create a synthetic based on those stocks and pass it on to you and sell as different units. REITs, mutual funds, ETFs, all work based on this. So three and four are kind of interrelated. We also have um, active management, like active mutual funds, hedge funds, venture capital funds, and so on, that, that try to deliver additional alpha using proprietary skills. So we see a bit of that in, in um, asset management as well, uh, in, in DeFi as well. But the key thing I want to highlight here is that when you talk about DeFi transactions, we're not, people like to talk about peer-to-peer, -peer, right? The blockchain is a peer-to-peer -peer world, so DeFi also peer-to-peer. -peer. Not exactly true, because um, a blockchain transfer is peer-to-peer, -peer, right? If I want to transfer to an address, I transfer directly from my address to your address. But we're going to see later that when you do DeFi transactions, you're not interacting with the other address. You actually don't know who your counterparty is. Because the way DeFi protocol works is you put everything that you own that you want to put to work inside a common liquidity pool. And then people interact that pool, interact with that pool. So I like to call this a peer to contract or peer to pool interaction, not a peer to peer. You may have heard of arrangements, financial arrangements like uh, Wong Share, right, in Thailand. So this is like basically a, a pool of capital people put together to be managed as a mutual. Yeah, I think another name for this is a mutual, right? Different, in different countries, they have an organizational form called mutual where everyone chip in together. And then um, however that pool of funds is being managed, we're going to pass through all the benefits to the participants. That's essentially how DeFi works. So we'll do a couple of case studies and then this will mark the end of today, I think. The first one is gonna be a maker protocol. This one, I will highlight a few places, but I want I, I encourage you to read the, the white paper behind this. Back in around 2016, 2017, there was no, no stability inside the, the uh, crypto asset world because prices were just very volatile. And people wanted to use crypto assets as currency. But as we know, currency, one of the, one of the aspects of currency is stability, right? And this, the word store value typically is used as saying that, oh, it doesn't depreciate over time, but really store value, the true objective is, can I contract? Can I make an agreement with you using this, using this accounting system, accounting value to do an intertemporal contract? That's a technical way of saying that if I enter into a loan agreement with you today, I won't regret denominating my loan in this currency, right? So you know, by using gold as a denomination, you kind of screw that if you pay in, if you borrow in gold and pay interest in gold, but the exchange rate of gold changes over time, right? You may end up paying a lot more than than uh, the additional amount of gold you have to pay because I borrow ten units of gold, I pay back ten point one units, but ten units that I borrow used to buy buy um, not a lot of things, but now that I have to pay ten point one units in gold, ten point one units can buy a lot of things today, so it 
it is a lot more expensive than the 1% that's being charged. The store value is actually, uh, if you read the literature, the true intention is for you to be able to make contractual agreements across time without regretting using that currency as a denomination to make that contract. So because of this, right, maybe some certain, as certain assets doesn't decrease in value, but the fact that it increases in, increases in value over time makes it a very challenging currency to make intertemporal contract with. That's why they wanted to have stability inside stablecoin. But there are several ways of creating stable coins. A lot of them at that point in time didn't use the full capability of decentralized finance, smart contract capabilities. So what they wanted to do was, let's create a stable coin using just smart contract. Because in this way, I don't need to convince everyone that this coin, this token is, is valuable. Because if you can see the conditions on a smart contract and you see that the reserves backing this token is sufficient, I don't need to do any convincing. Everyone convinced themselves and no problem. Okay, we are all done. So they wanted to do this. But if the objective is to create just a stable coin, okay, Maker, if you look at the uh, website, in some websites, they classify this as lending protocol. Let's see whether this website classifies it. What is that? Okay, they don't classify. This one doesn't classify Maker as lending protocol. But let me see if I look at DeFi Pulse. This is a different website that classifies DeFi protocols as well. If I recall correctly, they still classify Maker as lending. Here we go. Number one, um, Ethereum, Ethereum uh, protocol, Maker, lending. If you read the white paper, the white paper doesn't really say it is a lending protocol. Because why? The objective is to create a stable coin. So what are we doing? I want to create a stable coin. Okay, I mint the token. And this token, I promise to you, this will be exchangeable at the rate of one US dollar per coin, always. Okay, great. But what, what, what we really want though, is not that you're gonna be able to exchange this with me at $1 per coin. I want you to exchange among other people at $1 per coin without feeling um, any, any suspicion. Suspicion might not be the right word, okay? Without, without um, having to worry about anything, because I know for some reason, this is really worth $1. That's what we really, really want. So what could happen? I, I, I might question that, can I really exchange it for one US dollar per coin? Okay, how do we do that? Maintain enough reserves. If I, as a protocol, has reserve that is valuable, more valuable than one US dollar per token that I issue, if I want to give you $1 worth of wealth or assets, every time you redeem one stable coin, I have that. Okay? That's how international reserves currency function. Thailand maintains international reserves currency in excess of the amount of currency. When I say currency, I mean a banknote and coins in circulation. We have plenty of foreign exchange reserves compared to our banknotes and coins in circulation. So if you really want to know whether Thai baht is worth say 33, 34 US dollars or not, we have plenty of assets that, allow, that the Bank of Thailand can actually exchange Thai baht for you for foreign assets. So that's how we do it in the traditional world. So in the DeFi world, if you want to have a stable coin worth $1, you better have other crypto assets that are worth at least $1 to make sure that I can always redeem it. This is sometimes called a convertibility in international finance, right? I want to be able to convert BART to something else without any restriction at the price that it is meant to be. So how do I do this? You have to be, I have to give you the trust that you can, you can always exchange this for at least okay, one US dollar. So how do I do this? Um, I can do this through a loan mechanism. Right, a loan mechanism. What's that loan mechanism like? If I want to say, if I want to have stable coins to use, uh, I can create stable coins. The protocol allows creation of stable coins. Anyone can go and create stable coins, mean stable coins themselves. But the condition of that um, protocol, it doesn't just 
mint stable coins for you. You have to you have to do something for it first. You have to put up collateral to make sure that a stable coin that you take out worth a hundred dollars is backed by something worth more than one hundred dollars. Say I want it to be worth at least one hundred fifty, but to be safe, let's just put in two hundred. This way, I can make sure that this hundred dollar stable coin, which in terms of monetary economics, any currency. It's actually a liability of the issuer. So if it is the state, the country that issues bank note, it is a liability of the issuer to convert this bank note into something worth uh, equivalent value to that bank note. I'm not sure whether they taught you this in other classes or not, but when we talk about money in today's setting, it is not just about bank note and currency. Uh, bank deposits is also money. A bank deposit is a liability from the bank that um, if you really, if you want to get your deposit out of the bank, the bank has to find money to pay you for that deposit you give to them, right? So that means money or stable coin is somebody else's liability. If you want to convert that stable coin or want to convert that money back into something that has equivalent value, you better be able to do so. So they do this by by um, having this backing, right? This reserve backing to back the $100 worth of stable coin. There is $200 worth of ETH to back it up. Now, it could just be done like this, right? They could just be done like this. But then there are a few more questions. Okay, why do I want that stable coin? That, that, that's true. I, I don't really know why I want that stable coin, maybe to, to spend. Then in that case, why, why do I want to put up that $200 E to create $1 of stable coin? Why don't I just sell the $200 E for $200 and have $200 in ca or cash on hand instead? That, that's a very good point. That's a very good point. So what they do is they create a saving protocol that allows you to deposit this stable coin okay, to earn money. I, I, I use the word money exchangeably, but technically speaking, this is not money, by the way. When you deposit this stable coin, they're going to give you interest. Okay, great. If I deposit stable coin, I get interest. But where do I get the interest from again? Hmm, good question. Where am I going to get the interest from for people who deposit? Then if I want to have tokens to pay interest, maybe I should start earning some revenue. So instead of just being able to take out this die with no consequence, I'm going to say, oh, if you want to borrow die, you have to pay you have to pay interest. So this interest would go into, right, this interest would go into uh, the, the protocol that allows this creation. And this kind of also gives you an incentive to come back and redeem as well, because otherwise you just take this die out and then be done. You won't come back and get that collateral. So they make it like a loan instead. But their objective wasn't really a loan, right? A maker wasn't meant to be a lending protocol. But what they wanted to do was to create this stable coin through this over collateralization mechanism. If you're familiar with how securitization works, this is securitization. You put in $200 worth of risky collateral, risky assets, and then you create a triple A rated fixed income security in the form of stable coin against that collateral. And then you can sell that stable coin, that security that you created to someone else. This is, is essentially how asset backed security works. Right? And if you are the owner, of that, of that um, stable coin now, you created a stable coin by locking $200 worth of collateral. So if I want to get my collateral back, what do I do? You better redeem your loan. Right? You send back the tokens that you created, that you owe to them, and then give it back to the protocol. They would then unlock the collateral to you. By the time the collateral is unlocked to you, it might be worth more than 200. It might be worth less than 200. But that's the reason why we, we ask you to put over collateralized um, uh, value of assets to back up that $100 of stable coin. Because otherwise, if, if you put in $100 worth of collateral and the value falls down to say 50, you just got away with $100 worth of something where your collateral was only 50, I would just walk away and give away the collateral 
and use this hundred dollars instead. If you take this thinking one step further, wait a minute, this one hundred dollars only has fifty dollars worth of collateral. Is this hundred dollars really worth a hundred dollars? No, it's not worth hundred dollars anymore. So that's that's the interconnection between why do I need to keep this collateral on hand? A lot of collateral on hand because otherwise, who would believe that this is really worth one hundred? Okay. Now, when you want to redeem this, you send back the, the um, amount that you took out plus the interest or you now you can unlock the, the tokens that you pledge with them. So the die will be minted okay, when you lock the collateral and take out this die loan. And if you wanted to unlock your collateral, you would send back the die repayment plus the interest to the protocol. They would then burn the stable coin and will unlock the collateral for you. If somebody else wants to create a new die, they'll go back to this process and, and mint die again. I'll, maybe next time I'll show you the research I did to show to, 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 to look at the minting and redemption statistics of this protocol over the past couple of years. Right, so I think I will skip. I won't skip this, I'll talk about this, sorry. They use a bit of vocab in here, which is interesting. Okay, this is an interest rate model. You borrow 100, and uh, this is not the, the actual number, but it works similarly. Okay? It, 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 it asks you to pay something on top of what you took out. They call this stability fee, but in essence, it's really an interest rate. But interesting choice of word. They don't call this interest rate because they don't want people to view this as a loan, but it really is a loan. Right? They call this stability fee because this stability fee is meant to keep the DAI exchange rate, the stablecoin exchange rate, stable, is meant to over collateralize, is meant to, and so on and so on, right? But I don't want to use an interest rate nomenclature because otherwise people would think, oh, this is a loan, isn't it? Right? So interesting choice of word. But when they talk about, right, when they talk about the savings, once you have DAI, you can deposit DAI into the protocol and they're going to give you the, the interest rate just like a bank deposit. And, and that is a stable coin. So it works just like US dollars too. Now they say savings rate, right? So they want to make this look like savings, but they don't want to make this creation look like a loan. But that's marketing, right? We know that in essence, this is a loan. This is a securitized fixed income security creation that, that uh, carries an interest associated with it. Right? The, the fascinating thing about this blockchain is how they update the amount and so on that you owe. Imagine this, okay? I'm not sure whether you are uh, in a position to engage or not, but let me pose you a question. If you are, if you are a bank, okay, how would you keep information of who owes you what? What would your database look like? Say if I have to make, if, if I borrow a hundred, right? And now I owe you 101 because of that principle. And also there's a $1 of interest. What would your database of this borrower look like? Would you put in 100 in your database? Or would you put in 101 in your database? Or well, actually, maybe this is confusing. I, I make it confusing. On the first day that you borrow, you put in 100, right? So how often would you update database of how much that person owes you? Let's ask it like this instead. If you're a bank, how often would you update your database? And when you update, what changes would you make to that database? If, some, if somebody borrow money and hasn't, bought, hasn't paid you back yet, Thoughts? If you are the database uh, manager of a bank, what information would you record in your database? Let's see if I have this slide for you later as well. Yeah. 
right? That's an answer in the chat. Maybe every time an interest payment is due, right? If interest payment is due and then you don't pay, oh, I'm going to have the original amount 100 plus the interest of one you owe. Now you owe the bank 101. Thank you. Um, thanks. Thanks, thanks, for the, uh, thanks for the answer. That's, that's, that's what you might want to do, right? If you're a bank. But the thing is, in this world, when you want to record new information on a database, you know what? Every recording on this database costs you gas whether anyone makes money or not. So if I, if I use the logic of the bank and say, I'm going to put in the 100 that you owe, and then every time, I, every time that um, interest payment is made or due, I'm going to update information to 100.1, and, 100 and, 100.2, and so on. If there's no payment made and you record all those information on a blockchain update again, you're going to pay gas, and that gas is going to eat you up. So what do they do? Computationally, on the blockchain, all you see is this guy borrows 100. That's it. So how do I know how much this guy owes? They would keep an interest rate index okay, in another part of the blockchain that contains, at this point in time, uh, it's like if, if I put in $1 today, okay, and every block, the information updates. If I put in $1 today at this interest rate updated and next block 15 seconds later, my money would grow from 100 to 100.0001. Next block, it grows to 100.002 and so on. It gets updated at every transaction at every block. I keep this index and then I re-multiply this index to the original balance that I took out at. I took out this 100 two days ago. I don't update information for this guy at all. All I keep for this guy is 100 two days ago. If I want to know how much this guy owes right now, I multiply 100 this guy owes two days ago by the change in this interest index accumulated over two days. I would now know that this guy owes 100.002. And that information does not need to be recorded on a blockchain because you can use a read contract that we saw earlier, right? We can store the interest rate index somewhere else in our protocol and then look up interest rate index and then compare this to uh, what your balance is at. Now you don't need to record this information on the blockchain and this saves gas. If you are writing this system using the normal logic of normal database, this would not be, be an important point at all. But in this world, right, if you're interested in becoming a blockchain uh, protocol designer, you have to think about every calculations that you write on a blockchain, is this necessary? Because if it's not necessary, if it doesn't create any value, there's no place for that. You're gonna ask users to pay gas or you might be paying gas without getting anything back in return. Okay, so that's, that's one part which I find really fascinating about this. Um, and since it's being decentralized as well, how does it work? Oh, it has users, right? The vault is the ETH vault that we saw earlier. You open the vault, you lock your collateral in the vault, you can uh, take out die. These are the users, direct users. On the left-hand side, we have people who are the teams, uh, top and also left, sorry, let's do top first. These are the users, okay? We have the developers who are the coders who write the smart contract, right? Behind every, every address, there's always a human or a team of humans that wrote those codes into the smart contract. So these are developers. We need them to start to write, to maintain the code, and after that, maybe we don't need them. There's another set of, they call, they make it look like people, but it's not like people. Okay? And Oracle is a system or smart contract inside your, inside your address that allows, that allows the blockchain to look up information on the internet and import that information onto the blockchain. Because if you don't instruct the blockchain to look up information or import information, it can only interact with information that's on the stone tablet that's shared by the whole village, right? So an oracle is, you can think of it as a person that you trust to import information outside the blockchain onto the blockchain so that we can use it to compute. So if you are wondering, Ajahn, how do we get this $200 worth of ETH? That's a good point because on a blockchain, there is no $200 worth of ETH. That's how many units of ETH that you put in. But for this to be $200, you need to multiply the amount of ETH by the price of ETH at that point in time. And this is where the Oracle comes in. Without this Oracle, you can't make units of ETH into dollar value of ETH. 
So this is another place where if you're a protocol designer, you have to take a lot of care because uh, uh, which ETH price do I look at? If you look at websites like CoinMarketCap and so on, there are hundreds of places that you can look up ETH price for. Which, where do I look? Do I use a part, the price at this point in time? Do I want to use a time weighted average over the past 30 minutes? Do I, not look, do, I not, do I want to look at the price across multiple types of pools? These are the design choices you have to make because um, it affects the uh, contract computation. We have what's called keepers. Okay? Keepers is the way maker call the external liquidators. Because maker doesn't want uh, two things. Uh, maker doesn't want to pay gas. Okay, number one, if I, if for some reason the collateral value falls below a healthy level, I might think 150 is the minimum acceptable collateral. If collateral value falls below 150, falls to like 140, 130, even though it's over collateralized, I might say that's that's a little bit risky. I don't want this to, to to, to continue the downtrend. I'm gonna delever you. I'm going to reduce your debt position from 100 to say maybe 50. So the over collateralization ratio is still healthy for me. I as maker, I can do this myself. Okay, I can seize the collateral myself. Or alternatively, I can say, I let anyone who is interested to repay the loan on the borrower's behalf. Why would I want to do that? Because when you repay the loan, you will get the collateral that backs the loan up. So suppose I repay the full loan, right? 101. And the collateral is worth say 160 right now. You, you put in the 101 to repay the loan, you take 160 collateral out. So you make money, right? By repaying the loan because the loans by definition, they are actually over collateralized. So it's always worthwhile for the loan to be repaid. So this is on the user. If you are the borrower and you forgot to repay the loan, Somebody will repay the loan for you and then they'll take away your collateral. And there are different mechanisms and how they repay, you know, maybe auction, maybe uh, direct repayment, that's depending on the design. So this, this gives a maker two advantages, right? Number one is that they don't pay any gas because the liquidator will be paying gas on their behalf. And number two is that they can, they can say that this is fully decentralized because maker does not liquidate. Users in the ecosystem interact even keepers, the liquidators, are users in ecosystem. This is fully decentralized where everyone provides services to each other. All we do um, is to merely facilitate transactions between all of us. And then finally, they have governance. Um, MKR is a governance token issued by Maker. If you hold the Maker governance tokens, you can vote for changes inside the protocol. The thing is, do you need to have decentralized voting? No, not really. Uh, do, do the people who get to vote, are they users? No, not necessarily. It can be anyone who holds these voting tokens. I may not have any direct interest in the protocol, or I may not be the one who borrow stablecoin. I might not be savers. But if I hold this token, okay, I get an opportunity to have a say in how the direction of this protocol is going forward. You can think of this as gimmick. Maybe, or you can think of this as a truly open and decentralized way of administering governance of a protocol. Maker is an example of a DAO, a decentralized autonomous organization, because they decentralize their applications. Yes, that's one thing, but they also decentralize their governance structure so that the holders get to vote in a democratic process. You know whether the vote happens and the the uh, you know the actions get taken or not is not about smart contract because if the votes get taken, it doesn't mean the contract will change itself automatically. You know the developers have to go and change the contract as well. So there's still a certain layer of trust, of human trust, you have to have in these protocols as well, right? Even though it's organized as a decentralized autonomous organization it is not exactly autonomous in a sense that changes, the computer doesn't write changes to its structure. It is always the developer who implement those changes. Okay, so that's uh, gist of this. So 
what's the takeaway from this, right? Minting token is actually pretty easy, but minting tokens that people want to use and hold is difficult. So here's an example. I can always mint DAI, but why would people want to have DAI? Because it is backed by this collateral. So now it has value, right? DAI token um, is an ERC20 contract that is part of Maker Protocol. So a protocol is a federation of smart contract addresses that interact among each other in a way that finally delivers you the outcome that you want. Uh, the vote is a different contract. The die is a different contract, possibly, right? Some protocols may span hundreds, tens of addresses, but as a user, you may not need to know all that because all you would see is the user interface mask that uh, is designed in a way to, to facilitate the, the interaction with the protocol. Okay, so, so when we're managing risk and so on, we do this by using the smart contract, the, 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 the liquidation modules that we saw earlier. And when the, uh, you know, the compounding uh, example I told you earlier is done by having the interest rate index. So you can always read the, if you're interested in the in uh, decentralized finance and this protocol design, I re-urge you to read the documentation of MakerDAO because they, they it's, it's very well done. And then you understand why uh, smart contracts in different uh, written in that way and you see the limitations right um, so this is meant to to show you right the interactions between different um, uh, different modules inside the inside the uh, protocol that are, are meant to interact together so that from the user experience you get to have that stable coin you get to have that liquidation you get to accrue interest in a way that uh, delivers the outcome of the final experience of the user. Right, so here, the rate accumulation function, total debt you owe is how much you, you uh, borrowed out, right? And then you multiply that by the, by the uh, changes in interest rate index to show you how much debt you actually owe this protocol right now. And finally, if you look at the, the, the flows between different um, functions inside the protocol, this flow chart will give you that description. Okay, so it's a system of smart contracts where the functions, once called by users, and if you call that function using the right contract, right, you pay gas, they will interact in a way that will end up replicating the financial services. Looks like I went too slow compared to what I intended. So we didn't get to the actual okay, um, lending protocol. So let me actually uh, not push too far in this and um, start next time fresh instead so that it's all cohesive. In the remaining time, if you have questions, comments, or things that you'd like to know more, right? you can always uh, use this to yeah, make requests and so on. Next time, I'm going to complete this decentralized lending to show you how it works and show you some of the output of some of my research that uh, address these. We're going to talk about stable coins a bit, with a bit of background of what uh, money is like. Uh, we'll talk about um, how the decentralized exchange market making algorithms work. And then uh, we'll talk about the yield farming. That's the game plan for next time. So let me uh, just to remind you, add this too, that we still have this compound lending. Okay. To, to look at next time as well. So I have a question, how does algorithmic stable coin work? This is going to be part of this, okay, how stable coins keep value. I will show you three ways, four ways, but you can group it up as three ways to, to maintain the value of stable coins. But the general principle of maintaining any stable coin is, number one, do you have reserves to back the stable coin? If you have reserves, people are confident. But what you, what, you, uh, what you designate as the reserve value is a different issue. And number two is, do you have the arbitrage? Um, do you have the peg and the arbitrage opportunity available so that when you have deviations from the peg value, can the arbitrage activity push the price back to the intended peg again? algorithmic or not, mostly is all about the reserve value. 
what you what you put down as the the backings of the value of that dollar per dollar stable coin. Stable coins have a very important role because once you create these coins, they're kind of fixed to a nominal value with stability. Right? When you combine this with the synthetic creation, you can always create, once you have one stable coin, you can always create a stable coin of a stable coin and then create another stable coin of that synthetic stable coin again. That's, that's um, the capability of this world, which you know, depending on how you view it, can be something that, that is fascinating or something that is extremely risky. Right, that is pretty much the content of today. So I spent a long time on um, how the, the blockchain works because um, I think it's important to, to understand the, the primitives of how, how the coding or even information storage works in this ecosystem. So that once we come back to how these tokens, how these numbers are used, it might give you a better sense of you know, where value is coming from. Okay. I, I still repeat the same message that creating numerical values and ERC20 value is extremely easy, just pay gas. But what gives value to that ERC20 numerical values is you know, these promises that you make that are tied together using mathematical formulas. Right, I will stop the recording.